I hope you are well today. I am very sorry for the delay for this video. I went a little too deep reading the light novels of Isekai Minecraft series. Well this is a compilation of the online shopping Isekai manga with the latest chapter included. And for those who are here for part 5. You can just click to the final timestamp. Drop a like and subscribe for more awesome videos. Thank you very much. Kenichi Hamada, a freelance manga artist who works from home in Tokyo. He makes his living through art and animations of popular games, but he soon gets tired of his life in the city. And when the bullet train network finally makes it to his hometown, he decides to move back and start a new life while working in his hometown. While he hated his previous lifestyle, growing vegetables in his family garden was much more enjoyable as now he have the nice slow-paced life he wanted. But by the time he noticed, he was already standing in the middle of a forest, he wonders what might have happened to him. Kenichi can still remember his name, age and where he lives, so did he got himself into an accident while looking for some herbs? He then check his body which doesn't seem to be hurt. And looking at his surrounding he assumes that he must be in the middle of a forest, but there shouldn't be a place like this near his hometown. And when he walks further he doesn't seem to find his way out. And soon enough his throat feels rather dry and he had nothing of use in his pocket either. Even if he gets hungry he have no food water or anything, although he spots mushrooms. But it's a kind that he had never seen before. And if things go like this, he would be a dead man in no time. While thinking about a way to get out, he notices something. There was a dead body lying down on the ground. He apologizes and searches its bag. There he finds a ring and a knife on the body. Now he have a weapon but the biggest problem was food. Looking closely he sees the metal armor which couldn't be a replica, since there are marks of it being damaged and repaired. After thinking about it for a while, he finally realizes that he must be in another world. So instead of dwelling on it he thinks of accessing the status board, which every Ice Guide protagonist gets. And guess what, it actually worked, there was his name age and three type of skills. Looking at it he was confused since there was HP or MP mentioned, and what was this Shangri-La thing? All he could think of is the online shopping site. Kenichi thinks about it, and then press the screen. Suddenly a site pops up. He notices that it is the same site that he uses so much in his daily life. Shangri-La is an all-encompassing online store that sells books, food, clothes, etc. Basically Amazon. Kenichi also had an item box skill, so he takes the rusted sword and puts it inside his item box. Now he can just press the screen and summon the rusted sword. This was rather exciting and convenient for him. Then Kenichi tries his third skill, Trash. Pressing that, transported his sword to a new menu. Below he noticed a swirly button. By pressing it, a new screen pops up, asking if he wants to empty his trash. He deduced that it was kind of like a computer. So now Kenichi have an item box and a trash can. All he need now is to test how many items it can fit inside. But he was a bit doubtful about his skills. What if there was a catch to use his power? Although Kenichi didn't want to rely on his power, if he doesn't use that, then he will have the same fate as the dead guy. So Kenichi tells himself to not worry about it and use it while he can. Then he goes on to buy some food online, but he notices that he is unable to purchase them because of insufficient funds. Kenichi starts thinking of ways to add money, which brings him into the screen of recharging funds. A new screen pops up, but till then his brain had stopped working due to hunger. Suddenly he notices what to do and drags the rusted sword from his item box to the new screen. The system asks if he wants to sell this item, and looking at the amount he would get by selling this, Kenichi was exhilarated. He sold the sword and got 100,000 yen in his account, then he bought some food. He was distraught about the way he got the money, but he need to eat before thinking about anything else. Later Kenichi buys a shovel and buries the man who was left alone to die. He needs to pay respect, since the only way he could live was because of what he received from him. Then he buys a portable gas stove, gas can, pot with lid and a bottle of water. And then he gets a large curry cup ramen with chopsticks and it's done, the taste of modern civilization. While eating it, he thinks of making money from a nearby village, because sooner he will run out of food and money. Then suddenly he gets surrounded by ferocious wolves. Kenichi freaks out and tries to buy a weapon, he searches for a bow. But sadly he have never used one in his life. But then he buys the slingshots and bunch of fireworks. He begins burning the fireworks and throws it against the wolves, scaring them. Then he starts shooting rocks with the slingshot in his hand. After getting smashed by the stones, the wolves freaks out and starts to leave. Tired Kenichi sits down and thinks about leaving since it's too dangerous to stay here. 
After walking for a while, he finally came out of the forest. But outside he still had to deal with the tall grass. Kenichi thinks that he will need something to scope out the place with, so he buys a telescope and a ladder which are a bit expensive but he ends up purchasing them anyway. He looks through the telescope and spots a city ahead of him, and there he sees some people. Now he can easily get to the city from here. Then he looks at his money, which he already spent half of it. While Kenichi thinks about buying spices and selling it for profit, a villager comes by asking him if he wants to take a ride to Dahlia, which is the city's name. Kenichi was shocked since he could understand their language. Then he tells them that he appreciate their offer, but he doesn't have any money. The villager decides to take him for free as he is almost near the city. They both introduce themselves. The villager's name was Few, and he is a merchant. Few asks him if he was here to do business? Well, yes, he was right on the money. That's what Kenichi decided to go with for now. Few then asks if he is here to do business. Why is he empty-handed? Does he have the item box skill? Kenichi was surprised that he knows about that skill. Few then tells him that this was his first time seeing someone who has item box. He then asks why haven't Kenichi become a merchant if he had that skill. Kenichi spews some more lies and tells him that until now he have been a farmer. Then he starts to gather more information regarding the city. Kenichi finds out that he will need to register himself into the commerce guild if he wants to do business, and the registration fee is one silver coin. They arrive in the city of Dahlia. Kenichi helps Few out with his stuff and before parting, he hands Few a bag of spices as thanks. Shocked by seeing spices since they were luxury good, Few wants to pay for it, and before Kenichi could intervene, Few tells him that merchants do love cheap goods, but they will never take free goods, because nothing is more expensive than something free, right on the money. Few then pays him two silver and six bronze coin coins which is the market value of the spice. Later on his way to the inn, Kenichi realized that he now have a pretty good grasp of how the world works. But there are some concerning rumors. He heard that there is a spice union that is monopolizing all the spice trade. But first he need to set up a base of operations for now. He finds his way into an inn and meets the girl who is taking care of the reception. Kenichi finds her rather cute. She tells him it's one silver for a food and room. So he gets a room without food. She then asks if he was here for a construction job. Kenichi explains that he came here to become a merchant, so that means he should be able to read and do maths right? Shocked, Kenichi wonders how could he forget about that. The girl teases him saying that it's a necessity to read and write if one wants to register with the Commerce Guild. Kenichi tells her that he can read and write but only in a different language. She then asks him a question, if you have four bags of apples with twelve in each, how many apples do you have in total? Kenichi quickly answers it's forty-eight. Impressed by his knowledge the girl asks for his name, and she introduces herself as Azalea. After registering his name, Kenichi asks Azalea if she could teach him how to read and write, since he would need that to register with the Commerce Guild, and if she helps with that he will give exotic snacks in return. Hearing the word snack Azalea was exhilarated. Later in the room, he gives the box full of sweets into her hands. She was mesmerized by having the sweet fruit jelly. Azalea tells him that she feels like a noble being able to eat this. Kenichi asks does nobles exist here? Of course, but it's better to not get involved with them. Azalea tells him if they catch him with these sweets, they'll definitely confiscate it, which will be very troublesome. Then Kenichi brings out paper since it'll probably be expensive to use theirs. Well it was sad since Azalea wanted to charge him for the papers. Hearing this Kenichi realized that he can't drop his guard around her. After a while, Kenichi perceived that their language was very similar to Japanese, and they even used the similar Arabic numbers, so he can quickly memorize all of it. Azalea tells him if their language is similar to native language, then he will probably be fine when he register with the Commerce Guild. After learning that Azalea is clearly literate, Kenichi praises her telling she is more suitable for doing business. Azalea looks at him and asks, Do you know what's the most important thing in business? He thinks about it, and tells, Is it restocking? Well, yeah, but she has no idea where to get the essentials from. But if it's Kenichi, he will be really successful on the market. So maybe she should try to be his lover. A bit weirded out, Kenichi gets embarrassed and claims that he might be the same age as her father. Only for Azalea to tell him that she doesn't have a dad, which sombers out the mood. Kenichi then picks up a brush and tells Azalea to hold still for a second. After a while, he draws a portrait of her and he ends up making the best portrait for her. Impressed by Kenichi, she starts to undress. 
While this took a very weird turn, even Kenichi was surprised. Azalea gets closer and tells him, it would be unfair if she was the only one receiving, while she does have a point. Kenichi then wonder if it will be fine to do something like this just after transporting to another world. That thought didn't last long, since the next morning he wakes up after doing the deed, and making that face ain't gonna change the situation. Guys, the mangaka skipped the cultured part, but if you still want to look into it, it's at the end of chapter 1. Kenichi ends up filling himself with guilt, while she happily chows down on milk and granola. After tasting the food she thinks that this could sell really good. Well it uses sugar and fruits so it's too expensive for townspeople, and he don't want to deal with the nobles. But his main problem was the naked girl casually eating breakfast on his bed. Kenichi thinks of paying for the room, and he checks his status screen. There he realizes that she cannot see his status screen, only he could see it. There she reminds him of the room fee. And he asks if she could tell him how the currency works here? Azalea begins explaining the whole thing to him, which makes him realize that one night here was three copper coins, meaning three thousand yen. Yesterday he spent a lot of money, so now all he can think of right now is making money soon. At that moment, he thinks of heading to the merchant guild. There he notices that the place is filled with various people. He heads towards the reception, and the receptionist greets him. Kenichi asks her about registering to the guild. She tells him to fill out the form and asks for one silver coin for registration fee, which will be 50,000 yen. Kenichi asks if he will be able to pay in installments, which is fine. Thanks to installments, he has some breathing room. Kenichi looks at the registration documents, which was handwritten, so the printing technology was not developed yet. He fills out the name, age and hometown, then he finds the arithmetic questions in the form, which make him feel like they are not even serious in the first place. After he was done, the receptionist gave him the guild card, which was nothing but a piece of stone that he will be able to use whenever he is doing business. Now that he was registered, Kenichi asks her, where could he find the market? Later Kenichi is astonished to see the bustling market of another world. He notices that no one was selling fish since they can't preserve it. But there were lots of fruits and vegetables, and even knives and stones. Everything was just randomly placed together. One guy was selling a sheet of brownish paper for one copper, another was selling a crude knife for one silver, and a lady was selling a plain plate for one silver, and double that for pattern plate. Kenichi could see that the pattern plates weren't selling well, so if he wants to target townspeople then he can't sell expensive goods. While thinking about that, a pretty girl calls out for him, and he ends up buying some fruits from her. He doesn't know the names of it, but when he stores at the display states green as capel, yellow as yapple. And Azalea calls the red one Zapple. These are pretty sweet and delicious. As the inn was crowded, Kenichi decides to head to his room. Concerned Azalea asks, did he manage to register? Then Kenichi shows her the piece of stone, which made her overwhelmingly ecstatic. In his room, Kenichi was preparing for his business tomorrow. His goal was to turn every 3,000 yen spent into 10,000 yen. So even with low profit margin, if he can earn a decent amount, then he can get by with Shangri-La. After all, his goal is to live a slow life in another world. Next morning, Azalea walks into Kenichi's room since the noise was way too loud. Well, he was making his stall, so definitely it would be loud. Azalea was shocked to see that he could do carpentry too. Well, there were lots of strange tools, so maybe. Kenichi tells her that he would clean the room so there's no need to worry. He then starts to build his stall and thinks about what to sell. Azalea looks at the clip he was using, and asks if he would sell that? Well, she wants that to use for her laundry, since she uses a thin piece of wood split in two to hold her laundry, but they always fall in no time. Listening to it, Kenichi thinks that maybe he could sell this. While on his way to the market, he spots a free space. He asks the neighbor lady if the spot near her is free. Kenichi then pulls out his stall from his item box. The old lady tells him how enviable it is to be able to carry one's good empty-handed. Then she looks at the things he was selling, and notices the laundry clips. The old lady asks, how much is it? Well, that would be one copper coin for two piece. She buys six pieces, which made Kenichi quite happy. His stall did quite good in the market, and by the afternoon he sold 30 laundry clips earning him 15,000 yen. Now he feels like he'll be able to live off selling laundry clips alone. But if he does that, other merchants will pop up with imitations, so it's best to keep thinking of new things to sell. Suddenly a guy comes up asking to buy a knife. Kenichi notices him carrying a sword, so he may be some kind of knight. The young guy checks the knife, which costs two silver coins, so kinda expensive. 
The young guy does like it but he wanted something bigger. Well Japan has sword and firearms control laws, so Shangri-La doesn't have big blade item. But Kenichi pulls out something better. The young guy was excited to see a beautiful hunter's knife, which costs one gold coin, which was way over his budget. Kenichi notices that he was conflicted, but this wasn't an item anyone could buy cheaply, so he felt sorry for him. But the young guy ends up taking it anyways, so as a bonus Kenichi throws a whetstone for free, which made the young guy quite happy. Later Kenichi paid five days' worth of lodging fee in advance. Azalea was shocked by it. She notices him wearing a new shirt, so she realized maybe his business did went well. In his room Kenichi was having curry rice for dinner. While surfing in Shangri-La he finds a drum bath. With this he could easily take a bath from the river. And with this problem solved he went to sleep, wondering if he could sell accessories in his shop. Next morning in the market, Kenichi was selling necklace and brooch for 10,000 yen. It's not a diamond or crystal, but a cut glass which should still be worth a fair amount. Then a half-beast girl shows up around his shop. Kenichi stares at her skirt, which seems to have alerted the beast girl. She rushes toward Kenichi's shop and claims that she could smell the spices on him. It seems that she is really eager to have some spices and asks if he could sell them, even though he claims to have spices but they weren't for sale. Then the old woman explains that if Kenichi sells spices and gets found out by the Bacopa then he will be in great trouble. After hearing that, she quietly walks off depressed. He does feel sorry for her but he don't want to attract much attention. Soon enough a maid comes around asking for some laundry clips. She gets 100 pieces, shocking Kenichi. Then she looks at the jewelry. Kenichi tells her that isn't a diamond but a polished glass. He even tells her that he can save one of them for her if she wants. She thanks him and leaves. Just when he thinks of closing the shop, some beast men comes around him, asking if he will be willing to sell some spices. He thinks they must be the companions of the half-beast girl. He was afraid if he gets marked by someone dangerous, then he'll never be able to do business again. But instead of doing something bad, they start kneeling down begging him. He felt a bit awkward by that. The people begin to claim that Kenichi will go out of business if he ends up selling them in the first place. The bears gets depressed, seeing them like this he makes a new deal. Kenichi tells them that he can't sell any spices but he can make a meal out of spices for them. He then tells them to meet near the riverbank in a distance. The old lady asks if she can accompany them as well, now that the matter has settled. They get picked up by the bears, and they make a run towards the riverbank. Later they arrive in front of the riverbank. Kenichi pulls out the pots and ingredients to cook. So now it is time to get cooking. Everyone was shocked to see the other worthy stove. The old lady asks if she could help, so Kenichi tells her to help cut the vegetables. She was shocked to see the color of the carrot, but Kenichi ensures that they're edible. They all started making food together, and after a while, the meat curry and vegetable stir-fry was ready. Then they all enjoyed the food since it was something that they have never tasted before. The beast man even starts thinking of having a drink at that moment. Kenichi instantly takes out the shochu to have some drinks. But in exchange they have to avoid speaking about this whole event to anyone. Kenichi realized that they have forgotten to introduce themselves to each other. They started to introduce them ones called Nayakero, Nayamuro and Nianji and the girl is called Mayuri, And the old lady is Anama. After having the dinner they chill out near the campfire. Later they even go for a bath, which ends proving Mayuri as the strongest. Later he dry off Mayuri, and they all sleep under the open sky. Kenichi was there too, under the blanket with Mayuri's sweet touch. He looks at the Shangri-La screen, and wonders where does the goods come from. And the more he thinks about it, the more mysterious it becomes. But for today it doesn't matter. Next morning Kenichi had a deep yawn. He felt like he must have gone a little too rowdy last night. Anama comes in and he greets her. She then asks if he was alright since last night he drank a lot. Well he was fine. But this morning when Azalea asks him about what he has been doing the last night, Kenichi explains that he was drinking outside with the beast folk. But she seems to have found Mayuri's hair on him. And since then she has been ignoring him. Well it can't be helped since he doesn't need women for the slow life he's aiming for. Suddenly a lady and her maid came in front of Kenichi's stall. It was the same maid from yesterday, and the lady with the straight blonde hair seems to be her mistress. Kenichi assumes that the maid might be here to pick up the necklace. She then pays for it and shows it to her mistress. Shocked by the necklace she wonders if it was diamond? The maid tells her that according to the owner it's made of glass, and Kenichi confirms it's glass, and further asks if it's to her taste. Intrigued she asks if Kenichi could show her other accessories that he has on him. 
Kimichi then pulls out different jewelry on the table, and she gets Shaxi an item box holder. Well, actually, Kimichi just bought all those from Shangri-La. Curious. The lady then thinks about it for a while, then makes a request to Kimichi. But first she introduces herself as Primula, the eldest daughter of the Mallow Company. Hearing that Kimichi gets anxious, Primula then asks him if he would be willing to come to her company and speak with her father. Kimichi whispers to Onama if she knows anything about the Mellow Company. She tells her that it's one of the largest company that does honest business in this town. He thinks that it might be a good idea to make some connections with a large company. Primula further tells him that her father is at the mansion now, so meeting today would be preferable. Kenichi agrees, and she thanks him for agreeing to her request. He was shocked to see the daughter of a large business bowing her head to him, and he further thinks that if she is like that, then her father must be man of character. Sometimes later they head for the mansion. Kenichi was psyched to ride in such an expensive carriage. Primula was delighted to see that. She then tells him that they tried to reproduce the laundry clips that he sold yesterday, but it was impossible to mass-produce. Well, it can never be successfully recreated since it requires a high level of manufacturing technology, and the coiled spring used in these clips cannot be made without a machine, and trying to reproduce in a home workshop would be difficult. It looks simple at a glance, but Primula understood that it takes a high level of technology to make. Soon enough, they arrive in front of the huge mansion, and they lead Kenichi inside. He was sitting inside a luxurious room. Looking at the decoratives, he wonders if he could buy it from Shangri-La. Then a man introduces himself as Mallow, the owner of Mallow Company. They both introduces themselves, and Primula whispers to her father that Kenichi seems to possess an item box. Kenichi claims that it's small, but then Mallow reveals his own item box. He tells Kenichi he made use of his item box to grow his company to where it is now. Well, that was incredible. But as a farmer, Kenichi only used it to store crop. Then with a stern look, Kenichi asks, what does he want it to discuss? Suddenly the room quiets down. Mallow asks Kenichi if would sell his goods and wholesale to his company? Kenichi remembers Primula's reaction at his stall, so it seems his goods would sell for more if they were sold from an appropriate place. But in that case why haven't they just bought them from his stall and resold them without asking him? Mallow then asks what would he have done if he finds out about this? Well he'd probably stop selling it altogether. Mellow further tells him that his business rival might have contacted him and offered a much better price, so to not let a large business opportunity slip he decided to have a conversation with Kenichi. Then he offers to split the profit 50-50, and Kenichi instantly agrees. He thinks that the product he buys from Shangri-La are a lot cheaper and they will end up selling it 4 to 5 times more so he will earn a lot for his living expenses. Delighted by their partnership, they both shake hands, and Kenichi ends up signing the contract with one of the largest business in town. Mallow Company also provide finishing services and exchange glass for diamonds, but the technology for cutting gems is still lacking, so accessories made from cut glass are more popular than the real thing. And apparently Kenichi made a million yen on his first few pieces of jewelry, and his balance in Shangri-La exceeded billion yen. Kenichi thinks if he makes this much money his slow life plan can move forward. So he decides to make a base in the forest. The townspeople don't go near the forest since they say it's dangerous. And even he got attacked by a monster, so it's crazy idea. But he have already ventured 200 meter into the forest, so it shouldn't be that dangerous. He wanted to live a quiet and carefree life, with his frozen food and instant noodles plus he wants to use electrical appliances, so a secluded place is good. After he decides a location he will clear out the land to build a house, and to his surprise he even found a log house in Shangri-La. Next day Kenichi was clearing out the area to build his house, he decided to connect path with the road to avoid walking through tall grass, so he used gravel to make a road, since the gasoline for the grass cutter was quite expensive. After completing it, he purchased a chainsaw and started cutting down some trees. He need to do that to make a clearing for a log house. He does a small cut on one side and carves out a triangle on the other. Then he hammers a stake into the smaller cut, and kaboom, it's down. Now Kenichi needs to clean up all the wood he had cut down, but then he wonders if he could fit all the logs in his item box. After a while he founds out he could easily do that, and if he chops the log in 10 centimeters cut, Kenichi can use the log as firewoods in the future. So now all that left was to dig all these huge stumps. He chops it with chainsaw and then dig up the stumps. But the amount of work was too much for him. And like a compulsive buyer he bought a frickin' excavator. 
Kenichi splurged 1.2 million yen on this thing. It was used once so it had some rust on it, but more importantly, with this he won't get tired. He gets into it, and as he switches it on, his heart sunk, it wasn't starting. He then remembers that heavy machines use diesel, but where was he gonna get that? He searches for it but even Shangri-La doesn't sell diesel. After some deep dive he finds out that addition agent can convert kerosene into usable fuel for diesel engine, and he found white gasoline in Shangri-La. 1800 yen for a liter was a tad expensive but he doesn't have any choice, so he bought it anyway. Kenichi then buys a diesel generator. He fills it up and starts it. Well it seems to work. He also bought some light bulbs to test it and they lit up. But the voltage fluctuates a lot so it wasn't usable. And above all it was too damn loud so let's turn it off. With this he can use the excavator. So now he decides to head back to town. Next morning, Azalea asked Kenichi where he had been. He tells her that he was clearing land in the forest to build a house. Azalea was quite shocked to hear that. Well that was tend to happen since living in the forest was some sort of taboo. But Kenichi had some countermeasures like an infrared lights and a warning buzzers to fend of wild beasts. The only real problem were the bugs. Azalea suggested him to buy bug repelling magic stone from the second hand store near the market. Later when Kenichi enters the store, he was greeted by the old man, who asks where he was from. Kenichi explains that he had just opened a street stall at the market so they're basically in the same business. The old man tells him if he had some interesting foreign item, then he will buy them at a good price. Kenichi then pulls out some oranges and asks if he would be able to sell bug repelling magic stone for this. The old man was intrigued by the oranges, so he sells of the magic stone for a discount. Later Onama was impressed that he was able to get a discount from that old man. Well the old man was pretty well known as a walking encyclopedia, so making him an acquaintance is a good idea. Anama then hands him a pamphlet and tells him about a dangerous group called Shaga, who were spotted about 60 kilometers away in the mountain. Kenichi was shocked to hear about the bandits. She further tells him that they were a pretty big group and have made a stronghold in the ruins of the old castle. From there they pillage the surrounding town and villages. Concerned about the bandits he closes the shop and looking at the today's earnings, which were about 20,000 yen. He wonders if his sales were down because of the Mallow Company. The next day he was clearing out the area, and he managed to do that in one day with the help of excavator. And it was fun to drive so he wasn't tired. He was also flattening out the area for the foundation. But after buying this excavator his funds took a massive hit, so he thinks about raising some funds. Later at the Mallow Mansion Primula greets him with a humongous, beaming, smile. She tells him there were long list of customer eagerly waiting for his product. Well these were high-end goods so it took a while to craft, which was definitely a lie. Primula takes him to a room, where he is greeted by Mallow himself. Kenichi lays out all the goods on the table. This time he had pendants, necklaces, and a beautiful urn to store sugars. Primula really liked a bracelet, and requested her father if she can keep one. But if she does that then there would be less item sell. Well that being said Mallow asks Kenichi, what would be the cost of this? Kenichi then realized Mallow was weak to his daughter pleading. He tells Primula the bracelet looks golden but actually it was just gold plated. Shocked by it she asks why would the craftsman use such a time consuming process. Kenichi then lies about the craftsman being a strange person. He then shows the urn with sugar in it. Dejected Mallow tells him that the country has a monopoly on sugar and salt so they can't sell that. Well Kenichi had already bought one kilogram of sugar for 200 yen thinking he would make a large profit, but now it can't be helped. Leaving it aside Malo informs him about his pendants being a hit with nobles. Later in the forest, Kenichi had earned 15 gold coins by trading with Malo company. So with this he can buy this log house and say goodbye to his tent life. He excitedly pays up 1,700,000 yen for the log house. A bunch of wooden planks falls down behind him. Shocked, Kenichi wonders what could have happened. He looks at the screen, and by the log house picture, it was mentioned about this being a self-assembly unit. Well apparently this log house was a self-assembly kit. No wonder why this house only cost 1.7 million yen. But what could he do now? Doing it all alone would be impossible for him. Disappointed he sat down thinking what to do. Come to think of it he does have a heavy machinery. And by looking through the manual he finds out the structure was made by connecting thin boards together. And there's no pillar or beam. He gets up thinking he have come this far so he just gotta do it. After all he had already bought it. Then he notices the glass windows were shattered annoying him even more. Then he started assembling his log house. While running his stall during breaks. A week passed. And while he had some minor hiccups. He didn't give up. And after a month his house was ready. 
although the inside was just an empty space. But he can design the layout as he please. He also thought about making a kitchen and attaching a sink. As for the light he was currently using a gas lamp. He thinks about using the generator but it made quite a noise plus the fuel cost would be very high. So he decided to try out solar panels. There were a lot of things to do and after another month, his home was finally complete, and it does look pretty good. He built a fence and covered it with a wood preservation he bought from Shangri-La, and he planted marigold since his bug-repelling stone doesn't seem to cover his entire field. He also made a small field next to his house, and toilet which resembles one from his world. Inside his kitchen and sink were also complete, and he placed 20 solar panel in line which powers the multi-purpose battery with charging function. And above all, he could now finally take a bath. It was made out of drum, and he fills it up from the river nearby. This was his first bath since he came to this world and he's having it in the middle of the forest. With a great view of the mountain and sky, he feels this is the best and all that effort was worth it. Now that he have got his own land and house, his slow life in another world has finally begun. But he wasn't alone, as something was watching him from afar which was rather curious about him and his lifestyle. After he lived there for a month, one day he went outside with a camera to take a picture of his backyard. It's his hobby to make a photo album of all the flowers and plants that he see in this world. On his leisure walk he came across a massive beast which was injured. Kenichi freaks out and drops his camera. After taking a good look it resembles a cat but only bigger, like a leopard with thick fur or a mountain cat. Thankfully it was breathing but it looked weak. Kenichi noticed a broken arrow stuck on his waist. So he felt bad for him and as he went to help, the beast snarled at him freaking him out. But hearing the whimper of the beast, he felt pity. Kenichi then roped his arm with a cushion and bought a neck brace to protect himself from a bite. He was scared but he can't just leave it be. She started pulling the arrowhead. The beast was screaming in agony but he didn't bite. I guess he knew Kenichi was trying to help him. After a struggle he finally got the arrowhead out. And Kenichi wondered why it didn't resist? Well maybe because it was weak. Blood was dripping from the wound so he covered it with a cloth. He then disinfected the wound with a saline solution and bought an antiseptic from Shangri-La. Kenichi spreads the ointment on the wound and feeds it a painkiller. The beast was resting and it seems he was fine. Looking at it Kenichi wonders is this enough? Will it work? He had no idea. He can't just leave it in the middle of the forest. And he can't bring a living creature in his item box either. Which meant he had to buy an outdoor trolley to bring him in which costed 9,000 yen. He then tries to pick the beast which weighed more than 30 kilograms, and yeah, bro was struggling. But somehow he brought the beast in his home, and laid a blanket for it to rest. It wasn't moving so he wondered if he was too late. Well there wasn't any vets in the world but there might be some kind of healing magic, or even a magic stone. So he thought about asking around tomorrow. The old lady was peculiar about him going out of his way to save a forest cat, and calls him a strange person. Well Kenichi knows about that, since even the old man at the second hand store calls him that, and he came to know that the beast he saved was a forest cat, and its fur is a high grade material. Kenichi was even asked to bring it to the guild, but how could he? By then someone was sneaking behind him. You smell of a forest cat, nya. I wanna see it, nya. And it was Mayuriai who was hugging his hand very tightly. He couldn't say no, so he brought her with him. On the way Kenichi finds out that the forest cats were important to beast folk. Mayuriai tells him the forest cats were envoy of God to them and that's why she wanted to see it. I am not gonna say nya again. Kenichi theorized that the forest cats were like an high grade material for a humans but for the beast folks they're the envoys of God basically like angel. So the one who shot it with an arrow was probably not a part of beast folk. But suddenly Mayuriai gets hot tempered and berates the dog folk and they worship the evil wolves and the ones who shot the forest cat are probably them. Hearing this Kenichi then speculates that the cat folk must hunt the evil wolves then. Well of course, she replied, and now that Kenichi have saved a forest cat that meant he's now one of them. Kenichi then thought that he could have easily saved an evil wolf instead. Well that's what happens with a kind-hearted MC. Outside the house, Mayuriya was surprised to see such a beautiful home built in the middle of the forest. Well it did took a lot of effort. And inside the house, Forest Cat was still sleeping on his blanket. Kosuka looked at the food bowl and it was half eaten. Well it seems it hasn't regained his appetite yet, while Mayuriai seems concerned about the sacred cat's wound. Suddenly the Forest Cat went to lick his wound, but the medicine was already applied, so for the Forest Cat health's sake, 
Kenichi made it wear Elizabethan collar which costed 3,000 yen. Mayuri I then wondered if Kenichi was a doctor. Well he wasn't but he's confident that he could at least do first aid. Mayuri I was glad that Kenichi was a good guy since other people would have definitely taken it to the guild. Then she decided to stay over because she was worried about the forest cat. Kenichi asked if she was sure since he only had one bed. Then Mayuri I suggested to sleep together. Since Kenichi saved a forest cat she knows that he is a good person. After hearing that Kenichi wonders about this world's moral value. But well my area was pretty cute so how could he say no to that? Later Kenichi cleared the forest cat's wound, and for dinner my area caught a wild duck. He then pulls out a grill and started cooking a meal. My area really enjoyed the taste and the smell awakened the forest cat. Then Kenichi brings the meal out for him, and it seems he enjoyed it a lot. Next morning my area left for her home, so now it was time to till the field. He purchased an electric tiller for 16,000 yen, and it was working wonders. Then after 30 minutes he was finished. As for what to plant he had options like tomatoes, eggplant and potatoes. But for now he went with tomatoes since he didn't want a crop that's too difficult to grow. Technically he could just buy vegetables directly from Shangri-La. But for a slow life he gotta have a vegetable garden. And filling up jerry cans from the river and lugging them back every day was a pain. But bro was really driven by that slow life vibe. Kenichi then wonders if he could dig a well in the middle of the forest? Well there were so many big trees here, so there has to be a large water reserve underneath. These thought occupied his mind as he went to sleep. Next morning as the sun was shining bright, Kenichi opens his eyes to see a strange silhouette on the ceiling. Suddenly it plunks down on Kenichi's stomach, making him shriek. Well it was the forest cat, which seems a lot better now. Kenichi removes its Elizabethan collar, and the forest cat gets down and points towards the door. Kenichi opens the door thinking whether if it wants to leave. The forest cat then looks around and heads into the bushes. Looking at it Kenichi thinks he have done what he could so he tells it to stay healthy and live on. A few days passed he took a break from his stall and worked on completing his well. And finally it worked. Kenichi then uses a pump to draw water from the well and transfer it to his drum bath. He really had fun thinking about making various stuff. Well he got so absorbed in work that it got dark so decided to have a bath. While he was preparing that someone approached him from behind, and after hearing his name he was shocked. Kenichi then looks behind to find Primula standing there. Why are you here? Kenichi asks. Well his stall has been closed for a while so she was worried. Then Mayuri I told her about his home in the forest and guided her here. Kenichi then asked why did she came here without an escort? What if she was attacked by monsters? Well Kenichi was living here so she thought it would be fine. And she also heard about him helping an injured forest cat. Primula then asks him about the mass of metal on his yard. Hearing this Kenichi realizes that he have left the excavator out in the open. With no valid excuse he tells her that excavator is his summoned beast. And naive Primula believed it. She was amazed to hear that Kenichi could use magic. Kenichi was then taken aback by how quickly she believed him and tells her to keep this all a secret. Primula always thought he was a mysterious person but now that she had uncovered one of his secrets she was pleased. Hearing this Kenichi feels like someone has got a hold of his weakness. But if it's Primula it should be alright. The only problem were the nobles if they caught a wind of this then they would try to use him in any way possible. Primula then states that even for them at Mallow Company, it would be problematic if their business partner were to be snatched away by the nobles, since there are many nobles that do as they please. Kenichi then wonders that now the town gates must have likely been closed. Well indeed that was true. So it couldn't be that she was planning on staying here right? Well he can't be telling a woman to camp outdoors in the wilderness. Then with a vigor Kenichi tells her that he only have one bed. Well Primula doesn't mind since on long business trips it's normal to sleep with the opposite gender. Kenichi realized that she was pretty stubborn. And she herself wants to stay over so he can't kick her out. Then Primula spots a large drum and asks what's that? Well it was the bath. And hearing that she was quite excited. And asked if she could try. Later she took a dip, and from the bath tents Primula asked Kenichi if he was there. Kenichi was sitting by the wall facing other way. Well he has to be here because she was scared to stay by herself. Kenichi thought that she was like a little girl scared to go to toilet by herself. Then suddenly she calls for Kenichi and asks to poke his head from there. Well she is in the bath right now so it was okay. Kenichi does so and asks, how's the water? Well it's excellent. She never thought she'd be able to have a leisurely bath like this. 
and if it was a noble's bath then it would have to be built out of marbles, and construction of boiler and connecting pipes would have costed tens of million at the minimum. While she was saying that Kenichi was just engrossed by her beauty, and looking at him she got embarrassed. Realizing her embarrassment he goes to hide in the shadows, then Primula stops him since she was scared to be alone. Kenichi tells her if she was scared then she could have tried it another day, and what would she do if he was a bad person? Primula then gets up and tells him, someone who helped the beast folk and even saved the forest cat could not be a bad person. Kosuka then hands her a towel and a robe to wear until she stops sweating. Primula really liked the softness of the robe, but it was not for sale. If she wants in small numbers then he can maybe supply some. He then hands cup of liquid. She sips some and really liked the taste. Well it was milk that's been mixed with fruit juice. Primula then excitedly tells him with all these goods he could be the best merchant in the country. But Kenichi wasn't interested in that sort of thing. Living a quiet life and making enough money to eat good food was all he wanted. Kenichi then brings out a sketch book to show his hobby. He opens a page, and Primula was amazed by his drawing of the forest cat. She tells him with his skill he could be a painter at the royal palace. Embarrassed Kenichi asks would she like a portrait of herself? Primula then sits on the bed with an elegant pose, and Kenichi starts to draw her. After a while it was done, and it came out really good. Mesmerized Primula asks can I really have it? Well of course, she then hugs the portrait with an cute smile, and looking at it Kenichi was pleased. Later Kenichi bought an extra bed for her to sleep, and while on his bed he thinks about his ability which has a pretty problematic part. He wonders what happens to the money he deposits in the Shangri-La, since as long as you put money in you can buy any number of amazing things, so it's like a black hole that sucks money. But the money one gives to a black hole can never come back so eventually the country's treasury will run out, and it will suffer an economic collapse. Then probably he'd be held responsible for its collapse, or maybe he'd travel from country to country destroying their economies as he lived like a fugitive. And because of that he thinks about limiting his transactions so that an individual can handle, he would also have to think of some kind of plan for the future. The next day Kenichi and Primula both head toward the Mallow Company. Yesterday he ended up letting his business partner's daughter stay the night with him. So now he'd have to explain the situation to Mallow. Kenichi then thinks that Mallow would probably get mad at him. As soon as they arrive Primula spots her father standing in front of the mansion. Angry Mallow asks her where she was yesterday. Primula tells him she went outside the town, and since it got late she wasn't able to return home, therefore Kenichi-san let him stay at his house. Kenichi further tells him he couldn't let the daughter of his business partner camp out in the wild, so he had no choice but to let her stay at his place. Then Mallow apologized for the trouble his daughter caused. Kenichi here thought he would kick up a huge fuss, but was he not worried because they're far apart in age or was it because he trusts him? Worried Mallow there wonders who does she take after? Well it was obvious that Primula takes after her father, since if Mallow himself catch a wind of a potential business opportunity he would even cross a battlefield or navigate a forest full of monster to get there. After seeing the father and daughter bonding, Kenichi realizes that even her father is unable to keep up with his daughter's tomboy-like antics, and he's sure Mallow doesn't want his cute daughter to meet with any sort of danger, and even he thinks the same. Later Kenichi pulls out a towel, bathrobe and a nightwear on the table. Mallow was surprised by these strange fabric, and Kenichi explained its uses. He then shows them a risque nightwear, which gained a mixed reaction from them. Kenichi tells them this outfit was a secret weapon, for women wears this in front of a man she's interested in. Then no matter how stubborn he is he will fall for her instantly. But when he looked at Mallow's expression... He realized he made a terrible mistake. It seems his joke went a little too far. Then suddenly there's a sound of the doors opening. The maid enters carrying a large amount of books. Mallow states the Empire has adopted a new accounting method. So they're in the middle of rewriting all their accounting. Kenichi asks what kind of method is it? It is called double entry bookkeeping. It is something recently invented in the Empire. Hearing that reminds Kenichi of his old world. Mallow then tells him that the guild master of the merchant city invented this method, and in an instance it spread throughout the empire, and thanks to that he's also recommended as the next minister of commerce. Kenichi then thinks about this new invented method so was it just a coincidence? Primula then asks her father if today was the day they have to test that out. Mallow tells her that the craftsmen had informed him that it was ready, so they will test it in the afternoon. Excited Primula asks if Kenichi can see that as well? 
Well, it was a large item so they will see it outside. And Kenichi wonders if she was talking about the drum bath. He then heads out while planning to come by in the afternoon. Kenichi then goes to register at the Adventurer's Guild to make reparations for the future. Later at the Adventurer's Guild, the receptionist asks for one silver coin for the registration fee, and if he was registered to another guild then he'd have to show his card as well. A while later his registration was complete, and the receptionist tells him to refer to the bulletin board for request. Kenichi then looks through the bulletin board, and there he finds a request for gathering rare medicinal herb and a wanted person poster with high bounty. The Jaga bandit he heard about before also had a poster, and it seems he has a band of 50 bandits with him, and the guild was also paying a hefty reward for wiping them all out. Well it didn't concern him, so he heads back to the mansion. There he was surprised to see a hand pump in this world. Mallow and Primula asks if he knows of it. Kenichi then explains about the hand pump and how it's used to draw water by repeatedly raising and lowering the handle. Well this device is also starting to spread around the empire so Mallow quickly ordered one and asked his craftsman to make a trial version. Well as expected of a world without copyright, it's a free for all. But still a hand pump, and this morning it was the double entry bookkeeping. Kenichi then wonders if there's another person here who came from his original world. But his thoughts were cut short when both the father and daughter were amazed by how good their trial product was working. And sure enough, after seeing the hand pump, the reaction to his drum bath was lukewarm. Kenichi was bummed out by that so he sketches a bicycle, and asks Primula what she thinks about a vehicle like this. Looking at it Primula was holding her laughter, while Kenichi explains how it is used. Primula then shows her father the sketch, and Primula and Mallow burst out laughing stating it looks quite quirky. With the empty look Kenichi thinks the pioneers were also seen as a laughing stock first, so it's okay. And then he explains how this vehicle moves faster than running and how the rider doesn't get tired either. Mallow then holds his laughter and tells him it does look less tiring than running, so if a chance arise, he will let his craftsmen look at it. Hearing this Kenichi wonders this probably seems impossible, while Primula wheezes in the background. A month later Kenichi spots a bicycle on the streets, and when he asks the rider he tells him it was made by the Mallow company. Although his sketch of a bicycle was laughed at, it seems a few days later having realized its convenience Mallow had a prototype made, and now he's holding a demonstration by having someone ride through the streets on it. Slowly the number of bicycles increased, and before he knew it they became a normal sight in the streets. And apparently the government office is using them to relay messages, which means there's a postman-like job in this world too. And as the one who came up with the original idea, he was paid five gold coin. It was pretty cheap compared to the patent fees from his original world, but it's pretty nice of them to pay him anything at all for the idea. Later Mallow was recognized as the inventor of the bicycle and was commendationed by the Lord. Furthermore, he was allowed to take a family name. And after a few months bicycles called drainees were all over the streets, but his relaxing life in the forest haven't changed. And he bought some useful items from the old man so his exploration of the forest was progressing well. He also got vegetables regularly from his field, and the forest cat and the beast folk also brings him meat on a daily basis, and if he sells some of the meat from the prey to the adventurer's guild, the amount he get will be more than enough to live on. For a time there was a rumor about his rare appearance in the market, but when he completely disappeared with his stall, it didn't take long for them to forget about him. Kenichi now has more leeway with money so he slows down his business with the Mallow Company. The places he would have to visit has now decreased, but in exchange Primula now visits him very often. She sits there enjoying the chips made by Kenichi. Primula then asks him if it's alright to take credit for the bicycle's idea. Well Kenichi didn't mind since as long as he'd have enough money to fill his belly that is more than sufficient. In fact it'd be troublesome if his name end up out there. Primula then apologized for laughing at his bicycle sketch earlier, but Kenichi was not bothered by that. Primula then further tells him that when she was writing the final product, she immediately realized that this was something incredible. Well, he was glad to hear that, but Kenichi wonders, is she planning on staying over again? After it got pretty late they decided to sleep, so Kenichi decides to bring out some nightwear for her. Primula then shyly asks if he could bring out the set that he showed before. Worried Kenichi asks if she buys something like that then her father will scold her. Well, it was fine since she isn't a child anymore. Kenichi then asks if she had feeling for someone, whose heart she hoped to win by wearing this. 
She quietly tells him that person is right here. And after looking at her eyes, he realized she was serious. Distressed Kanichi tells her to sit over there for a moment. He then tells her that a young girl like her should value herself more. She shouldn't have a feeling for an old man like him. Primula interrupts him telling he's a wonderful man. Then Kenichi tells her that a woman like her should have no shortage of noble suitor. Well there's been talk of that but there's no way a merchant's daughter could ever be a legal wife. She'd be only seen as a potential mistress. In that case how about the knight that used to come to his store? Kenichi then wonders what would Malosan say when he knew what was going on there. But then Primula tells him her father is not against it. Kenichi then thinks that first they need to keep the matter aside for a while for now at least, and she asks him could they at least sleep together? Kenichi thinks about it, and guess what, they slept together. Well who could say no to those massive knockers? Next morning she leaves while he kept on thinking why does she like an old man like him? Later he goes to check on his field, and suddenly the same knight who came to buy his knife comes around. Kenichi greets him. Then the knight explains that there was a word of a suspicious man living in the forest so he came out to check and it turns out it was Kenichi. The knight then spots the solar panel and asks what's that? With no word to explain he tells him it's related to magic, and the knight then speculates that he's a sorcerer. Kenichi then tells him to keep this a secret since if the word got out it would be very troublesome. The knight then tells him he'd agree only if he listened to his request. Later Kenichi sells him a ton of ingots which the knight seems quite excited about. Kenichi tells him he could use this to make a long sword because he doesn't deal with weapon that big. Kenichi then pulls out two glass and asks if he'd like to talk over some drinks. And after buying a whiskey for 2,000 yen, the knight couldn't believe he'd get to drink this delicious alcohol for free, so if there's anything he want to know he'd gladly help. Kenichi then asks him about the situation regarding this country's foreign relations. The knight then explains that there are some small disputes with the empire along the border as the empress and the first princess are right in the middle of a power struggle for the throne, and it seems that the empress want the second princess to succeed the throne, so that's the reason why she is trying to finish off her own daughter. But it seems like it will be a drawn-out affair since the first princess has a powerful sorcerer on her side that wields unique magic, which has turned the tables in terms of military strength. Kenichi then theorized that unlike regular magic, the unique magic is special which requires no cost to use and can be used without limit, which means Shangri-La would also be classified as unique magic. The knight then remembers that the unique magic was something similarly called yellowish. Then Kenichi asks could it be mayonnaise? Well yes that's what it's called, and Kenichi couldn't believe what he just heard. That sorcerer also had the ability to bring forth a large amount of oil since there's stories of him drowning hordes of monster in sea of oil and setting them ablaze. Kenichi first thought mayonnaise as a magic would be a joke, but in large quantities it actually has the ability to become a weapon. He then asks for the empire's official name, which I am not gonna say since I would butcher the pronunciation. Later the knight leaves after a couple of drinks, and according to Sir Knight that empire has a custom where the newly enthroned empress use a divine treasure to transform into the form of a young girl which was kinda weird. While Kenichi was in the market, he thinks about Primula who he hasn't seen in months, while well, he did hear about Mallow and his daughter going shopping with a caravan in tow. And today's the day they're arriving back. He then spots a crowd gathering in the middle. He goes through the crowd and see a distressed Mallow, who was asking for help. He was begging for anyone to save his daughter, stating money won't be the problem. Kenichi then approaches him asking, what happened? It seems their caravan was intercepted by bandits, and when they were running away, Primula got caught. Kenichi was surprised to hear that. Malo's guard tells him how the guards tried to fight back but now their fates are unknown, since it's Shaga's gang. Shaga the head of the gang with more than 50 bandits, who have looted many villages and left them in a terrible shape, and now it seems it's too late for Primula. An impending silence keeps surrounding the whole town, and no one dared to step forth to help Malo. Kenichi remembers the smile of Primula, and suddenly tells Malo, he will go and look for her. Everyone stood still for a moment. Kenichi knows that the idea itself might be insane as he has never even fought in his whole life. Everyone must be thinking what can an amateur do. Well Malo was also among those. But all he knows is that if he doesn't act right now he is going to regret it for sure. Beside he now possessed Shangri-La. He then asks Malo for some money to cover his expenses. And Malo quickly hands him a huge bag, which Kenichi deposited in Shangri-La. 
Shaga's hideout was 50 kilometers away so he needs some extra help to carry all the firepower. He first thought about a horse, but he needed something better. He then came across a four-wheel drive truck which could transport 20 to 30 people. Well this is it. Kenichi then tells other to step aside since he's about to use summoning magic. Hearing this crowd speculates, if Kenichi was a magician, and as Malo was about to ask Kenichi what was he going to do, a four-wheel drive diesel truck came out of nowhere, which costed 2.1 million yen. People were shocked to see a lump of metal appear out of nothing. Kenichi then calms them down telling it's a horseless iron cart, and it obeys him. Someone asks if this could move without a horse, and lo and behold it was moving, people were surprised by such magic. Kenichi didn't think he'd bring a truck from Earth, but he was glad they had a medium-sized one. Soon he announces that he's ready to carry anyone who wants to fight the bandits. Weapons and shields will be provided. This is a chance to get Shaga and his gang's bounty. At that moment Mairiai comes in asking what kind of weapons will he give. Kenichi remembers her being good with bow, so he brings out a compound bow for 30,000 yen. She haven't seen a bow as good as this, and she seems excited to use it. Kenichi explains her about the bow being very powerful, but she can't fire it rapidly because it takes long time to be drawn. Then the other beast folk came in asking if they can get weapons too. Kenichi pulls out many weapons and tells them to pick any of those. They all chose one they prefer and started testing it out, and it seems these weapon quality were far better than the armies. Now that they are armed it's time to go and make some big bucks. Suddenly someone else also wants to join them. It was the knight whom Kenichi had met before. He then informs that his wolf fang was completed. Kenichi wonder what it was? The knight then pulls out a long sword which was made by the steel that Kenichi gave before. He proudly claims that hunting down Shaga is a fitting first battle for his wolf fang, and he will make sure to feed it plenty of blood from those crook. Well it seems his weird self was showing up. Suddenly the old toolmaker appears beside Kenichi and tells him he too would join him. Kenichi asks if he was sure. He tells him despite his looks, he used to be an adventurer. Then he waves his hand, and the ground bursts into flame. Kenichi was shocked to learn that old man was a magician. Then suddenly Anama yells at Kenichi. How dare he exclude her from the group? She starts to climb onto the truck telling him even in war people need food to eat. So she will take care of it, and if it gets dangerous she'll run away. Eight more adventurers steps up and he lends them crossbow and arrow. Even with these the odds for them are pretty bad. But Kenichi thinks there's no need to be foolishly aggressive, since they still have a chance to take them by surprise. He then goes to the adventurer guild, and the receptionist was surprised to see him take up the application to defeat Shaga. Well in this world there were no ranks for adventurers so one can accept any request, and if they succeed the reward from the guild, Malo company and the country will be quite hefty, but that's only if they make it back alive. Outside the adventurer guild Malo was waiting for Kenichi, he knew Kenichi was hiding something, but he had no idea it was that kind of magic. Kenichi then asks if he could do him a favor, while Malo would do anything within his power. Later Kenichi tries out the protective gear. He did search in Shangri-La for any kind of armor, and he found some, which Malo company purchased for him and the fellow adventurers. Kenichi then spots a beast folk with a shield. He tells him not to buy it because he have a better one. The beast man then asks if the shield is as awesome as the sword he pulled out earlier. Well it's something like that so he will show it when they get out of town. Kenichi also prepared the food which is in the item box so they will have something tasty to eat. Hearing this the adventurers started to drool. Well Kenichi's food are delicious. And in expeditions there's always gross food so just having a good meal makes all the difference. Later Kenichi drives off carrying the adventurers. 15 in total loaded in a 4-ton truck with weapons and equipments. They set off in the wilderness watched over by a crowd of people. Some pointed fingers and scoffed saying only 15 people couldn't possibly stand a chance. But there are times when a man has to go, even when he knows he might not return. While on his way to the hideout, which was about 50 kilometers from the town, Kenichi notes how the members of Shaga's gang have killed all the caravan's member. So it seems they have no regards for human life, which makes him feel quite uneasy about the state Primula might be in right now. He stops himself from having these thought and focuses only on rescuing her. Anama then tells him how amazed she is by this carriage speed which isn't even drawn by a horse. Magic surely is amazing. Kenichi was relieved that Anama believes this truck is a magic product, cause that saves him from a lot of trouble of explaining. He then stops the truck to set up a base for lunch. 
After a while, all the adventurer seems to enjoy the food made by Kenichi. It was a bright red vegetable broth with a plenty of meat. It was very distinctive so people can tell from one bite. Well that's because this world doesn't have any tomatoes. The beast folks were also enjoying their food while praising his cooking. The old man then asked Kenichi what were the beast folks eating. Well it was a bit complicated to answer since it was cat food. The old man then tastes the food claiming it was very delicious. Hearing this Kenichi wonders if he was okay upstairs. Seeing everyone enjoy their meal Kenichi realizes they were probably hungry since they came this far without lunch and one cannot fight a battle on an empty stomach. After they were done, Kenichi decided to construct a plan since they were about 10 kilometers away from Shaga's base. Their team would have to face against 50 bandits. Anama was worried since they were about to attack them in their sleep. But if they rush them in this steel truck then it'll wake them up. Kenichi then asks if the fort they were hiding in have gates or something? Well it seems so since they were using the old castle. The old man then raises his hand stating he could take care of the gate. Kenichi then asks if he's going to use magic to blow them up? Well something like that. Then they come up with a plan to attack them when they are drinking. Since when they're drunk it will diminish their ability to fight, their leadership will be disrupted and if they were eating they won't be wearing protective gear, which gives them a better a chance. Kenichi then remembers how this world people usually starts eating and drinking in the evening after dark, and they usually start getting drunk about two hours later. He then calls for Mairiai and hands her a walkie-talkie which he calls a magic tool that allow people to talk to each other at a distance. Kenichi then instructs her to scout the area and let him know about their routine. Since beast folks have night vision and dark bodies, they can easily blend in the dark. Later they test out the walkie-talkie, which works quite good and it amazes Myeriai. The old man then gives a sussy stare since even the magician from the Empire don't have a magical tool like this. Kenichi then brings out polycarbonate long shield for all the adventurers. And now it seems their morale is high now. Kenichi then asks the knight if he needs one? Well no but he appreciates the thought. Kenichi then gives out polycarbonate buckler to the beast folks, which are circular small shield. These were very useful to them since they have great mobility. Kenichi also buys an air gun laser which he would mount on his crossbow. He might hit anything at close range with this laser, but it would be awkward for adventurer to handle making it unsuitable for them. Kenichi then prepares to leave and tells Anama to take care of the rest as he explained. By tomorrow if no one comes back then she would head back to report about their failure to take down Shaga's gang. Worried Anama tells him that she is not good at reporting things to the authorities, so they must come back safely. Later by the evening, they reached outside Shaga's territory. Kenichi asks Mairiai about the situation. Mairiai who was hiding by the bushes informs him about a big wooden door which was surrounded by stone walls. Kenichi further asks if she could spot any enemy. Well, there were guards patrolling on top of the walls and judging by the voices inside there were a lot of them. Kenichi already knew this but now it seems it's going to be rather tough. After preparing for a while, now it seems they are ready to head out. Suddenly a beast man stops Kenichi and hands him a seed and tells him to bite into it, which he does so. Then suddenly he gets a pungent taste which almost makes him puke. But then his mouth starts to get numb, and his speech started slurring. Then it slowly started kicking in. He now could hear his teammates' thought, and he could see bright and clear in this dark. But why couldn't he stop laughing? Was that drug or something? Well, if he overdoes it then he'll become a cripple, but Kenichi won't go that far unless he was an idiot. Kenichi then kept these thought to the side and decided to go. He tells Mayuri to finish of the guards and as they were approaching, he thinks about this dangerous situation they were heading into and how he's starting to have fun. Well, he just can't help it. They reach the fortress gate, and Kenichi signals the old man, who then starts to chant a mighty spell. And just like that a massive explosion destroys the fortress gate. Everyone praises the old man, who then takes a breather since this was all that he could do for today. Kenichi and his party then burst into the fort, much to the shock of Shaga's gang member, who were caught off guard by this sudden attack. He then instructs his party to shoot at them, and just like that a deadly fight starts, some of Shaga's gang members steps forth to attack, but they were easily slayed by the beast folks. In the back the knight approaches methodically, then suddenly he gets attacked, which he easily deflects with his wolf fang, stating his sword were thirsty for blood tonight. He then slashes the attacker neck, and compliments about his sword's sharpness. By the side Kenichi thinks that everyone were doing better than he thought, although the knight was acting like a different person. Then he notices another group of guard approaching him. 
Kenichi then pulls out the excavator and starts swinging it wildly destroying every gang member on its way. Everyone there were in fear of this monster. Some even started asking for help, but it was too late to ask for mercy. Kenichi then slams the excavator onto the ground, revealing a group of women. It seems there were many other women beside Primula-san. Suddenly Shaga comes out bringing a woman beside him. He knows they are the strike team sent to rescue this girl, but he didn't think there'd be a powerful mage who could control such a monster. Anyway this was as far as they could go. Since he had Primula as a hostage. I mean her massive melons as hostage. Primula was very terrified. Seeing this angry Kenichi demands him to release her. Shaga then tightens his grip on her neck stating if he doesn't put down his weapon then this woman is dead. Kenichi then thinks that's quite a thuggish thing to say. Well he too said a protagonist type line though and despite the situation he strangely feels calm. Maybe it's because of those berries. He felt like he's watching a drama, as if it's someone else's problem. However he knows he would have to do something to help her. Again Shaga tells them to drop their weapon, as he grabs Primula's massive bedunkers, and rips apart her top revealing something that shouldn't be out in the open. Angry Kenichi tells him he's going to pay for this, and Shaga laughs at this telling them he should have ignored the noble saying and filled her with his love, as he licks Primula's cheeks. Hearing about the nobles being involved, both the knight and Kenichi realize that this has turned into some very serious matter. Kenichi then whispers to Mayuriai if she could hear him, which she does. He then removes the laser from the crossbow. He turns it on and points it towards Shaga and asks if she could see the laser. He then tells her his plan about how he will use the light to blind Shaga and tells her to shoot him when he does that. Kenichi then counts to three and shines the laser on Shaga's eye, blinding him momentarily. Kenichi then shouts, now, and Mayuriai launches an arrow straight to Shaga, which pokes his head and gives him a sweet rest. Well he got what he deserved for messing with those sweet puppies. Shocked by their boss death no one were able to react, then they were wiped out by hordes of arrows. Kenichi and the adventurers celebrated their massive dub, as they are now gonna get a massive load of money. The knight then tells them it's too early to celebrate since some people were wounded. Then the old man and Kenichi helps out the wounded people and the beast folks goes to search for other people since they could hear the cry of women's. Primula, who was still terrified from what just happened, ran straight towards Kenichi's arm. Suddenly he felt two massive bear melons squished to chest. It might be the effect of the strange nut, but Kenichi really had the massive urge to push her down which was unbearable. He then pushed her aside while controlling himself. He then confirms with her if the dead guy was Shaga the leader of the bandits. Well she did heard the other bandits calling him that. Kenichi consults with the knight about what Shaga said before his death, something about receiving orders from the noble. Primula confirms that she did hear from Shaga about a certain nobleman who paid him money to abduct her. Hearing this the knight was shocked, cause this means she is in a really terrible situation. Kenichi then thinks about how the nobles wanted her to get kidnapped and enslaved. He then asks the knight if he could search this place and find proof to back this. As the knight leaves, Mayuriai approaches Kenichi. She tells him about all the women who were kidnapped from their villages by Shaga's gang. Kenichi first offers them blankets to cover themselves. He then tells them he was from the strike team from Dahlia who came here to deal with Shaga, and they don't have to worry cause if they want he can take them home anytime. The rescued women were exhilarated to hear this. However only nine women expressed a desire to return to their hometown, and most decided to stay in Dahlia given the many opportunities it offers. A woman they asked Kenichi if the women group could have some time alone, since they haven't washed their bodies in days, and they would like to wash up a little by the well. Kenichi then offers them soap and clothes of their choice, seeing those they seems quite happy. Primula too asks for a pair for herself. Someone then calls for Kenichi, and it was Mayuriai who brought along a child. She tells him to get this kid in bath as well. Kenichi then calls out to Primula and asks if she could bathe this child and give him a haircut. He then hands her a scissor, and Primula didn't know what to do with that. Kenichi then shows her how it's used to cut hair, and excited Primula asks if he would also sell this through the Mallow Company. Hearing this Kenichi realized scissors were non-existent in this world, and even in the time like this a merchant's daughter had business on her mind. Then the other girls teases her for approaching a man while naked, and this seems to make Primula realize her surrounding and Kenichi then leaves that place awkwardly. Outside he was shocked to see the pile of corpse. He couldn't hold it in because the corpse were in very bad condition, especially the one that he killed were the worst. Behind him a beastman picks up Shaga's corpse. Kenichi asks what was he doing? 
Beast Man then smiles telling him he's taking the head as proof of their success. He then slashes the top stating since the bounty is a lot, a facial confirmation is a must. Kenichi realized as expected other worlds aren't as forgiving as Earth, he then tells him he could put their top inside his item box. Well that would great because over time they start to stink and it gets hard to carry, and inside the item box it won't rot so that was plus. But he never thought he'd be using it for something like this. He then sees the menu displaying 52 human head in his item box, which was quite overwhelming for him. Later the girls were ready in their new clothes, and Kenichi compliments them and they seem happy about it. The kid was also nicely cleaned, and it seems she was a girl. Kenichi then buys a new cloth and hands it to her. It seems she doesn't know how to wear it. Then the other girls helps her change and bam she was dressed in her new cloth. Kenichi compliments her as well, and asks for her name. She shyly tells Anemone. Kenichi tells her it's a beautiful name, and greets her. Later the beast folks were still scavenging the place. But it was quite late for Kenichi and the girls so they call it a day. Sleeping Anemone leans towards Kenichi's arms, she snoozes deeply. And now it seems the situation was settled so now they can return to Dahlia safely with new friends. Next morning Kenichi woke up to the huge amount of valuable things that they decided to bring along. Well these are the things the beast men scavenged from the bandits. The beast man then tells him that everything he sees here is worth money so it would be a waste to just leave it. Kenichi reminds him the women will be on the back of the truck so they won't have space. To which the beast man tells him there's still more valuable things inside the building. Everyone present there gave Kenichi a weird look, and he succumbs to it, and offered to take them all inside his item box. He placed them all inside and went to go make breakfast. One of the girl there told him about the vegetable field around the back. So now he only needs meat to have their victory celebration. Kenichi then bought a lot of meat. Then Kenichi and the girls started to prepare to cook, while Mayuriai and Anemone were picking up the vegetables. While cooking, Kenichi thinks he might be forgetting something. Then someone calls his name. It was the night. He searched the hideout and found evidence of the noble's involvement. It was a letter with a red seal on it. Kenichi thinks it's too amateurish to leave evidence like this. Or maybe they were too confident that no one would find out. The knight then speculates if the nobles had involvement in this. They would already know about the strike team and flee before they got here. Kenichi then leaves all these onto the knight since it seems he was forgetting about something important. It was none other than Anama that he forgot about. She was crying and very worried about their safety. Kenichi then went over to pick her up, and she was glad to see them alive and even Primula was safely rescued. All the girls were in shock since Kenichi only left for a few minutes, and he was back already. Well, he did have a truck which they first didn't believe about. Anama then spots a child there. She was shocked that they even captured a small child. This made her remember her past. If her kids were alive they'd be about this age. Kenichi then asks about her kids. Well she lost her first child to plague about 10 years ago. It seems this world doesn't seem to have developed medical care so the survival rate for children is probably very low. Later the beast folks were enjoying the meal made by Kenichi and they praised his cooking. While the other women also helped him in it. The bread was soft and delicious so they didn't even need soup to go with it. Seeing their faces it looks like today's dish was well received. He then notices Anama together with Anemone. It seems she had grown fond of her. Anama seems to be seeing her dead child in Anemone and is taking good care of her. Later after they had their meal the men entered the site again and began rummaging. Some even started digging up the corpse in the field and taking them all with them. And it was all stored inside Kenichi's item box. The old man was watching from the sideline. He tells him if nobles were to find out about his ability then he'd be in a lot of trouble. Well if he kept silent then it should be alright. But there were a lot of people so some might not stay quiet and also he doesn't have to worry about him. Kenichi thinks if someone does speak up then there's nothing he could do. So he'd just have to make as much money as he can. So if things get though he can just run away. They then prepare to leave soon. First they would have to send the nine women back to their village. He then asks Anemone about her village which was an elk. It was pretty far from where they are, it's about 7 leagues, that's 120 kilometers, which was pretty far. He then asks Anemone if she wants to go home then he can drive her back in his truck, to which she quickly nods no. Anama then explains that she was probably sold to make end meat. Kenichi realized Anemone was probably sold by her parents to a trader who was attacked by Shaga, and that's how she came to be here. They were about to send the girls on their way home so there's no time for tears. He then asks Anemone if she wants to go back to Dahlia with the others, and she happily nods, yes. 
so now it was time to head home. They then left the old fortress and drove along the road from village to village, but before they left he had one beast man run into town to report their successful win. They then approached the village and one by one the women disembarked. All the women got off quite a way before their village probably wanting to return quietly to their lives. They were also given one gold coin each to live on for about two months. They then leave the last group and make their way back. Anama tells him he was too kind to give them the money. But well the bandits treated them badly so he thinks they have a right to some of the money. Anama then tells him when he gets back to Dahlia there he will be treated like a hero. But that was not in his nature. Primula then states that's very much like Kenichi to have no desire for glory. Well he just wanted to make enough money to not starve and live quietly. And he's still wondering about how he ended up in this situation. He also had no idea about the one beside him with massive melons, who's deeply falling for him. Later they were almost at Dahlia. Mallow was outside the gate waiting for his daughter. Primula dashes toward her father. With Teary Mallow was happy to see his daughter. It was sweet reunion and even the people in the crowds were happy to see her safe. Kenichi was watching them from the sides. Then suddenly the beast man got on top the truck calling out to those who laughed at them to come out. The people in crowd were still in disbelief that they killed Shaga's gang. Annoyed the beast man asked Kenichi to bring out Shaga's top. He then showed them Shaga's face, which perfectly matched with the poster, and soon the doubts turned into cheers. Well they still had to report it to the guild. They throwed Shaga's top onto the desk freaking out the receptionist. The beast man tells them to inspect it to their heart's content, and he also tells them about the other 52 tops so they would have to stay up all night to inspect them. The knight then asks the receptionist to meet the guild master. He tells Kenichi he will see the Countess Clepios tomorrow and report about the nobility's involvement in this. If the nobles are involved then the commoners can't touch them, so he'll leave this matter to him. The staff then began to check the description with the wanted posters of the criminal. He also heard that the price money can be reduced in some cases due to difficulties. But the presence of the knight made it far more credible and everything went smoothly. After the faces were identified they received a reward of 1,725 gold coins in total, and each person got 15 gold coin each. This and the proceeds from the sale of various supplies taken from the enemy's hideout will be divided equally. Additionally he also received 80 gold coins from the adventurer for the tools and good food, one can never have too much money. He then sees Anama holding on to sleeping anemone. He asks if she is fine with 5 gold coins, she first declines it. Then Kenichi then pulls out one gold coin and asks to at least accept this much. Well that would be good for the food supplies and since she want to take care of this girl so might as well keep that much. Kenichi then gives out a gold coin to each of the girl that came with them to Dahlia. They will need money to find a job and a place to sleep so he urges them to take it. And if they are ever in trouble they can go to Onama or the old man to rely on. They then decided to leave and Primula also returns home safe and sound. Now that the gates are closed he will need to find a place to stay. He then reaches Azalea's inn, and she asks him if the rumor of him defeating a ton of bandits are true. Kenichi quickly declines it stating it might be another person. Well he had to say that because if they find out about the large sum of money he got then they would all gang up on him. But Azalea realizes he was lying and hugs him tightly. She asks if he remembers the promise he made about making her his lover. She even fakes crying while blaming him for toying with her. But Kenichi just wanted a room she can even keep the change this time. She even shamelessly started asking for some money. But then she looks back, and she was embarrassed to find Anemone holding Kenichi's shirt. Next morning they all gathered at the Adventurer's Guild to distribute the awards. And after talking it over they decided to sell the weapons and armor at the arms store. Each piece of equipments were stripped from the bandits, and in total it's worth 7.8 million yen which was quite a lot of money. Later he heard that many merchants have made their fortunes from scavenging, and thanks to this the market was crowded. The expensive items that Shaga had amassed were bought by Mallow Trading Company, and it sold really well among the aristocrats and the wealthy families. The furnitures and other stuffs were sold at the old man's tools shop, and they also split 100 gold coins from the bandit's hideout. After all the sales were complete the total amount was 178 gold coins, they then split the money among 15 people, 11 gold coins per person with fraction going to the captive women. The city payment from the guild takes time so they decided to get together again. The rescued women apparently will be able to find jobs and places to live on, so finally he is able to go back home. 
He stops midway and Anemone bumps into him. Looking back he asks her why have been she following him. Yesterday she followed him to the inn and stayed there just like that, and it was same in the morning. She states that she wants to be with Kenichi. He then asks if she didn't like Anama's place. Well it's because Kenichi's food was delicious. It seems she got baited with his food. He then tells her his house was in the wood. And there's also scary demon wolves and insects. She tells him she can deal with them. And with this he have no particular reason to turn her down. So he ended up bringing Anemone in the forest. They then arrive at the house. And Anemone was shocked to see such an amazing house in the middle of the forest. She then heard a rustle in the bush. And she freaks out and hides behind Kenichi. But it was none other than the forest cat, who brought along a prey for Kenichi. Seeing Anemone scared he tells her it doesn't bite. She pats the forest cat, and slowly they became friends. Later he asks if she would like to get another bed, which she quickly declined. Anemone then asks if she could sleep beside Kenichi's, which he wasn't so sure about. They both then gave him a sad look, to which he freaks out and agrees to it. She shyly thanks him. Then Kenichi realized how she was sold by her parents, maybe that's why she's so starved for affection. Kenichi then asks if she would like to learn how to read and write, which she nods yes. He then offers her curry and bread, she really liked the smell and after taking a bite, she was mesmerized by the taste, and that's how their day came to an end. Later the guild gave them their rewards and they all got together for drinks, he also heard about the execution of the nobles who were involved, and the knight was also promoted and entrusted with a small fiefdom. Myeriai and Primula also returned to their peaceful routine of repeatedly visiting him. Then one day after a month or so Anama visits Kenichi, it was her first time coming to his house. Well one can't blame her since it's literally in the middle of the forest. Anama then asks if Kenichi could give her anemone? Well she wasn't some little kitten, so she has the right to make her own choice. Anama tells her if she comes with her then she would teach her how to do business, so let's live together, but she wanted to stay with Kenichi. Anama couldn't say anything to change her mind. Realizing this, she tells her if she gets tired of staying her then she can come to her place. And just like that she leaves in a state of shock. Well this was Anemone's own choice so he can't force her to do anything. They then went on to have breakfast. Later he heard about the noblemen who were looking for him. Everyone in the market seems to be keeping their mouths shut. But eventually they will find him. After all he took out a truck and heavy machinery in the middle of the city. And one can't control what people say. So he decides to move out, he took apart the fence and pulled out the marigolds around the house, he then packed the solar panel and the generator. With this done he can now get out of here at any moment. Later he went to Malo's home, he went there to deliver the goods in exchange for the gold he borrowed. Malo already owes a great debt, and yet he's here bringing more good. Kenichi then pulls out a paper and hands it to Malo, it's a new bicycle design which includes a basket. Kenichi then wonders if the rescued women had found any jobs? Well they did and they have been working with no problem. Primula then tells him he doesn't have to worry about others, instead he should worry about the nobles who were searching for him. Kenichi tells her everything should be alright if he just disappears. Hearing this she freaks out asking if he's going to leave the town? Well that was just an option. But wouldn't it be better to have an audience with Lord, since he wasn't such an bad guy? Kenichi then states if they find out about his power and they order him to be drafted then he couldn't disobey them. Well that was true. Malo's family has taken good care of him, and he hopes saving Primula's life has returned the favor, so now it's time to move on. Later he tells Anemone about his decision to move out, and asks her if she wants to be with Anama, but she wanted to be with him. Kenichi then states that they might have to stay in the wild for a while, but she didn't budge. He really wanted her to stay with Anama, but if she didn't want it then he have no other choice. He then began preparing to leave for the next day. He then bought a road bike, which he could call a custom model of the popular Dre jeans to fool the people. And hopefully now he can find a nice place for his slow life. Kenichi then wonders if he could store the house without disassembling it. And when he does try it, it actually disappeared and it was perfectly stored inside his item box. He then tells Anemone to wear the helmet. And when he tries to drive off, something brushed past his leg. It was none other than the forest cat. Kenichi tells it he would be fine by himself, and with an expression implying his send-off, Kenichi bids him goodbye, and he drives off leaving him alone. His only regrets was not being able to say goodbye, but he didn't want to drag anyone else into his mess, so it was for the best. Suddenly he notices the forest cat running beside him. Kenichi asks if he was okay with leaving the forest, and it looked fine. Kenichi then wonders if he wants to come with him, 
and it seemed like it does. Kenichi stops the bike and buys a plastic box. He then covers it with wood to camouflage and ties it to the back of the bike. He then tells the forest cat to sit in here if he wants to travel together. Forest cat jumps and gracefully lands in the box. And just like that he was ready for the journey. Kenichi then drives off, hoping to reach a place with great view, where he can live the slow life he wants. He already have enough money so now he just have to keep his mouth shut and live a normal life. If he just use the money and live of local product then he can avoid putting money into the black hole. Or maybe he can dig up some precious metal somewhere and top up his credit on Shangri-La, and it seems there's another person beside him from his world who's in the hostile country, but he doesn't care to meet him. Suddenly he notices a card up front. It was Fiusan, the merchant who helped him first in this world. Kenichi tells him he became a merchant too. Excited Fia asks him where's he headed now? Well it was an unplanned trip with no destination in mind. Fia then wishes him for a safe trip and Kenichi drives off. Traveling under this vast blue sky with no destination in mind. But he had feeling that somehow it will work out just fine. And thus began the search for his next destination in this new world. Somewhere near a lake, Kenichi catches a big fish. With the fishing rod he bought for 2,500 yen from Shangri-La. The fish he caught was very similar to the one from his original world. And yet it had the same name in this world as well. Kenichi then went on to keep fishing as he reminisced about how he was able to rescue Primula after she was kidnapped, but he was told that the nobles were looking for him. So he left the city with an orphan anemone alongside a forest cat, and now they are on their way to travel to a new place. Later the lunch was finally cooked. Kenichi wonders how catching the fish by the riverside and making a soup with that makes him feel like a slow life he wanted, and anemone too was enjoying her dish. Kenichi then looks at her, wondering how anemone has been eating a lot lately. She might be 12 years old according to his assessment. So he would like to set up a new place for her as soon as possible. Kenichi then draws up a plan. According to the bike's odometer they are about 100 kilometers away from Dahlia. And from what they have heard from the people they are only 5 to 6 kilometers away from the next town, Aslantia. But he ain't gonna have a slow life in a city though. Nevertheless he decided to take a look around either way. Suddenly he gets reminded of something and he pulls out a camera-mounted drone for 20,000 yen from Shangri-La. Kenichi then wonders if it's possible to fly it from here and view the surrounding terrain, and when he pulls the joystick up, that drone flew up quite high. Anemone was amazed to see it fly and asks, Is it magic? Well it's something like that. Kenichi too was amazed by how well he could see into the distance. And sometimes later, Kenichi had a mental map of this area. The river seems to flow into a lake, and there's a small village nearby and the castle in the distance could be Aslantia. Then he notices a waterfall near the village, and it seems now they have a good idea about where to go. Later when they reached the waterfall, both were quite mesmerized by the view, and Kenichi decided to make this their next home. He then plans to set up his field a little further from the waterfall's pit, and since this place is beyond the territory of the nobles who rule Dahlia, they don't have to worry about being pursued for a while. Later when the terrain's preparation was done, Kenichi summons his house. He then hears a rustle from the behind, and it was the forest cat who ended up coming with them. Kenichi then wonders if the forest cat is going to stay, then he'll have to give her a proper name. What do you think about calling her Vel? Anemone thinks it's a cute name, so from now on forest cat would be called Vel in the narration. Later at the night, Kenichi plans for tomorrow to install the solar panels and prepare the field. He'll likely need to use heavy machinery, which means he'll need diesel and they don't sell that on Shangri-La. He currently use white kerosene which is quite expensive, so he'd like a more affordable way of obtaining fuel. He remember once seeing a biodiesel fuel being made from waste tempera oil, so he decided to get a book and do a little research. Seeing this anemone asks what was he doing, and when he told he was reading a book, she got excited asking she want to read it too. But it was not the same writing as this country's alphabet, so she couldn't read it. But Anemone was too hyped about this so she decided to learn the alphabet of Kenichi's country. He then buys a picture book of the Little Mermaid for Anemone, and gave her a conversion chart for Hiragana. Before going to bed Anemone was very engrossed in learning the new language, and just like this the day came to an end. Next morning she was studying on her own, and Kenichi went out to do his work, he have installed the bath toilets, and the solar panels. So now they almost have the same facilities as before. While thinking that he hears a rustle from behind, and when he turns back, someone jumps on him from the bushes. It was our lovely cat waifu, Mayuri. 
She was angry at him for abandoning her like that, and it was quite hard to follow the scent of Forest Cat and Kenichi's cycle. But if she can trace him that way then he'll never be able to escape from the beast folk. Well Mayuri-I doesn't let her prey get away. She then asks if she can start living with Kenichi? That's fine, but she will have to earn her own food money, and he'll ask her to run some errands into town. Later when they reach home, Anemone notices Mayuri-I with Kenichi, and they both happily greets each other. Seeing them acting like sisters Kenichi was quite pleased. mayuri -I then notices something. There were some pictures. She wonders if it's a book. Although she doesn't know how to read, even she can understand the book. And hearing this Kenichi gets a bright idea. Since there's a lot of people who doesn't know how to read, he can sell picture books and make a good money. If he buys a printing press from Shangri-La even he can make books. And since books are precious in this world, so even if they are thin, they'll sell. But he wasn't sure if he'd be able to turn a fairy tale from his world into a picture book. Kenichi then asks them if there are any fairy tales passed around here? Well there's one about the forest elf Sama. It's a story about an elf who lives in the forest and meets a human prince and she falls in love with him. But everyone were against it and the elf was almost killed. But they escape safely with the help of fairies and they live happily ever after in seclusion deep in the forest. Hearing this Kenichi decided to make a picture book and mimeograph with a composition of about 12 pages. And its price could be about 5,000 yen. So from then on along with tending to the fields and studying in books on biodiesel fuel, Kenichi spent his free time drawing pictures and composing the picture books. Later he buys a mimeograph printing for 7,000 yen. Mayuri I asks if he's going to make them now. Well yeah. First he drew a picture on a special paper, then he sets it in the machine, and then prints it. And voila it was ready. Looking at the picture both the girls were mesmerized by what just happened. While holding the picture Anemone was very shocked to speak, and Mayuri I was all too excited to try that. Later he decided to bind the printed copies of these pieces. For that he bought a desktop binding machine for 5000 yen. Then he sets the paper in the machine and applies glue. And it's done a nicely made book. Both the girls were also very excited to see it. Kenichi then hands one book to Mayuri I, and she takes it to Anemone asking what does this says. Although her words were kinda broken Anemone recites the story to Mayuri I, and she praises her for it. And behind them Kenichi goes outside. Maybe he was absorbed in bookbinding cause it was noon before he knew it. The book also turned out well so it'd be interesting to collect more anecdotes from this world. He then decides to go work in the fields. Then suddenly he notices a group of people docking by the shore. There were two human and a beast folk. Suspecting them as intruders, Kenichi pulls up a crossbow on them. Asking who they are and to state their business. The guy tells him to put that thing down. Cause they're resident of that village over there. Kenichi states he's a merchant, and there's no rule that says he can't live here. Well that's true but they're just here to check if Kenichi was a bandit. During their conversation Vel comes by to check on Kenichi, and looking at the forest cat the beast folk freaks out. Kenichi then introduces Vel as the part of their family. Hearing this the beast man tells his comrades to believe Kenichi, because a forest cat has affection for him, and they don't usually bond with a human at all so he can't be a bad person. They then let their guard down and one among them introduces himself as Crouton, and asks for Kenichi's forgiveness for disturbing him. Kenichi too introduces himself, and forgives them for what just happened. Later during lunch Anemone asks if everything is okay. Kenichi tells her it's fine. They were villagers from the other side, they just came to check over if there were any bandits, and he sold them some blankets and picture books. Mayuri finds that rude because they even have Forest Cat with them. Well from normal person's point of view they're top quality game after all. Kenichi then asks if Dahlia has been the same since he left. Mayuri then tells him how Baron Nor's pole proposed to Primula. It's the same knight who helped them to deal with Shaga. A formal courtship could mean she's going to be a full-fledged member of the family. Kenichi then wonders how if he were in Dahlia he would have attended the ceremony. But that can no longer happen. It's sad to see those melons go away, but one must move on. Sometime later while examining the surrounding vegetation, Kenichi was thinking about taking these plants to the town guild and have them appraised later. Then suddenly Mayuri I hugs him from behind. It seems Niko-san was in quite a mood. She then tells Kenichi, Anemone isn't around so, she wouldn't mind doing some fun stuff. And by looking at Kenichi's expression, he's about to clap them cheeks. Sometimes later, there's a loud rustle in the shack. A silhouette emerges through the door. He was wearing a chemical protective suit. And due to the heat, he quickly throws his clothes away and jumps into the lake. And that guy was Kenichi. He laments about how the shack's inside was like a sauna. 
Well after that cheat clapping session Kenichi had a post-nut clarity and assembled a shack he bought from Shangri-La, and now he want to synthesize biodiesel fuel in it. All the necessary materials can be found in Shangri-La, and he was able to learn about the methods from the books, so if he succeeds in making this an alternative fuel, this could allow him to use heavy machinery with greater energy efficiency. He then plans to try it out. He first pulls the generator's handle, and it was working just fine. So now it's time to start making biodiesel fuel on full scale. Kenichi then started making the fuel for the next few days, and he was able to process twice the amount of canola oil he bought from Shangri-La, yielding 90 liter of biodiesel fuel. But because of that, Anemone started acting a bit cranky, realizing her being in a bad mood might be because of him. Kenichi begs her to lighten up a little, but when it didn't work, he then promised to buy her a new book and asks her to come with him to Aslantia. Both the girls were very excited about it, and he too was happy to see them this excited. Later on their way Kenichi thinks about going to the Adventurer's Guild to register. He then asks Mayuriya if she's been to Aslantia before? Well yes several times. She then shows him the city's east gate, and when they enter the city, it was a beautiful town filled with people. Although it looked smaller than Dahlia, there were Drajeans everywhere. Kenichi then plans to head to Adventure Guild first, and both the girls follows. Later at the Adventurer's Guild, they enter to find the place full with many people. And when he heads to the reception, there stands the receptionist with a pretty smile and two big firm knockers. Even Kenichi was baffled by those. He then hands her his ID, while wondering if all the receptionists in this world are well endowed like her. She quickly takes the ID and head back to check, and in a few seconds she rushes out and asks if he is the same person who dealt with Shaga's gang back in Dahlia? Well yeah but he didn't want to get that information leaked, but he let this slide cause she's cute. Later he hands her two silver coins for two people and his registration was complete. Kenichi then asks her if she had any illustrated books on the types of plants in stock. Well she had a booklet on basics of collecting medicinal herbs. And for two silver coin he bought that booklet. She also informs him that the guild buys medicinal herbs. Well she was in luck cause he had some herbs to sell. But the black red jade grass wasn't in the booklet. Well that's because the plant uses the red berry parts for spices. So if they are fresh then she can buy them for a small silver coin per vine. Now that Kenichi had sold most of the plants that he have accumulated, he went to a butcher to sell the meat and he was told to pick up the processed meat in the evening. So now that they got the money they decided to get something to eat and they heads to the market. Anemone gets a bowl of soup and to her surprise it was tasteless. The bread was also rock hard. Kenichi too had the same reaction. He guessed this is the normal cuisine in this world. Kenichi then adds bonito broth and a pinch of pepper, and with that it tasted slightly decent, even the girls were surprised. Later when they were done with their meal, Kenichi spots a tool shop, and he heads there with Anemone and Mayuriai. Inside the shop were a variety of products, and on the table sat an old lady. Kenichi introduces himself stating he came from Dahlia, and the old lady wonders if he knows the old mage by any chance, cause recently he sent in letters saying he made a great discovery. Then she asks him what was he looking for? Kenichi looks around and spots a weird looking tool. Well if he is interested then she can show him how it's used. The old lady then grabs a pot of liquid, and judging from the aroma it could be wine. She then pours it on top and adds water from the other side. Later the drops that came from the right side were sludgy wine, and on the left side which water remains were clear and colorless. Kenichi theorizes this could be a tool to separate certain components from what is put in the vessel from above. Well he guessed it right, whatever one puts in the middle is pulled out and falls to the left, after all it's a tool used by alchemists. Kenichi couldn't understand how this works, but wait, he could use this thing to make biodiesel fuel safely, so decided to buy it and further asks if she had other interesting things? Well she have a book, precisely it's a grimoire. Finally, Kenichi found something that sounds otherworldly and fantastical. The old lady further explains if anyone reads this it allows him to use magic, but it isn't useful to a human without mana. Kenichi then thinks about the price of the grimoire, but well he is here already so why not give it a try to learn magic. Kenichi also buys some potions as well. Seeing this the old lady gets an idea, and states if Kenichi is like this maybe she could also join him. But the idea was quickly shut down. Later Kenichi and the girls were walking outside since they have to wait for the guild. He then wonders if he should have gone back home and returned later. But well Anemone seemed to be having fun in the city so it's fine. He then looks around to find somewhere to sit down and take a break. And there he spots Crouton, 
and hiding behind him was her daughter. He seems to be surrounded by three thugs, which looked very cliché. Kenichi then wonders what to do. Suddenly Anemone pulls on him asking if he could help them. Looking at those puppy eyes he have no other choice. But well if it was the woman with those melons Kenichi would have jumped at lightning speed. Nevertheless he decided to help. He also tells Mayuri if he gets hurt he will be counting on her. Kenichi then wonders if they see his face he might get in trouble. So he searches for a mask on Shangri-La. So for 7,500 yen he buys a pest mask. And it seems Anemone was quite taken aback by his new look. Kenichi then tells the goons to stop. It's not amicable to pick on a good father and daughter. But it seems they don't want to listen to that. Kenichi then apologizes cause if they don't back off now, he's gonna make them explode with his magic. And just like that he pulls out firecrackers and throws at them. All the goons freak out and run away for their life. Kenichi then notices the crowd that have gathered behind him. So he tells Crouton to escape from here. But it seems he might have overdid his act cause both the father and daughter were petrified. Later at the market, Crouton realized Kenichi was inside the mask, and he thanks him for helping out. Crouton then tells his daughter that Kenichi is the one who sold him the picture book. Hearing this she shyly thanks him, and later she meets with Anemone. Kenichi then wonders why those thugs were after him? Well his history with them goes back when he was an officer. Ever since they were caught red-handed they have always resented him, so whenever he runs into them on the street, they gang up on him. Kenichi then asks if he is in such a danger why doesn't he move. Crouton have thought about that but he doesn't know where to go. Kenichi then tells him about the newly created barony of Nor's Pole near Dahlia. He can write him a letter of introduction if he's interested. And he's sure an ex-official like him can turn around a better job. Well it is nice of him but Crouton needs some time to think about it. Kenichi too realizes it must take a lot of determination to leave one's hometown to go to another territory. He then peeks outside and notices that Anemone has been hitting it off with Crouton's daughter. She then runs at Kenichi and asks if he can make a new book for Mary. Kenichi agrees, and he'd get to see Anemone's beaming smile. Hearing this Crouton realizes Kenichi was the one who made the books. Well yeah, Kenichi draws in his free time. Above all since there weren't any kids close to Anemone's age nearby, Mary might be her first friend. After a few days of Anemone having a new friend, Mary started visiting her every day. Anemone too was excited asking Kenichi to make a new picture book, probably she wants to show it to her friend. So after a few days of printing the book, Kenichi spots Crouton hastily coming toward him. He drops a bag of coin in front of Kenichi and begs him to help them. Kenichi then tells him to calm down and tell him what happened first. It seems Mary got a really high fever, so he was wondering if this was enough for him to treat her. Kenichi then asks what's the disease called? Well according to the village head, it's an endemic disease that often affects children. Hearing this Kenichi decided to get some antipyretic for now. But if it's an endemic disease this might not work. Anemone then comes out asking what happened to Mary? Kenichi tells her Mary is sick and he knows she wants to pay her a visit but now she can't. Anemone then pulls his shirt and asks Kenichi to please help Mary. As much as he'd like to help her, he just don't think the medicines on Shangri-La are going to have an effect. But he gave Crouton a temporary fever reducer hoping it might help. Because if it's a disease that can't be treated with medicine, she might need some real magic. Kenichi then remembers the old lady who can use healing magic. So he decided to go and get her. He tells Mayuri to take care of the house and tells Anemone to stay with Mayuri. He already prepared food for both of them. As he might not be able to return home for a few days. Kenichi then gets his bike and leaves, as Anemone prays for Mary's recovery. Later he meets the old woman, and tells her about the situation. At Crouton's house, the old lady checks Mary and finds out, she is suffering from chicory fever. She was told that Mary was given medicine but what was it made from? Kenichi replies it was made from Willow. Hearing that she realizes Kenichi knows his stuff, so is he an alchemist? Well yes something like that. She then further states chicory fever is hard to treat with magic, so what can they do then? Well there's a cold river on the way to Suntaka. And the source of that water is a spring deep in the forest. There grows the seeds of the white flower which are very good for chicory fever. Kenichi realizes if it's a spring in the wood then he can be there in no time with his custom drasion. Well the old lady doesn't doubt that. But those area are elven territory. So if he runs into them. He would have to fool them well. Apparently they are a very strictly reserved tribe. And they don't get along like in fantasy. Crouton too decided to go with them. The location was about 20 kilometer from here deep in the forest, but in the dark the forest becomes more dangerous. Then the beast man Nyanyas also decided to tag along with them. 
so they decided to leave quickly right now while it's dark. Later on their way, both the guys were surprised by how fast Kenichi's Dreijin was. They couldn't believe he was keeping up with them, and the magic lights he gave them were also awesome. Well it doesn't matter cause first they have to pick the seeds for the medicine as soon as possible. Sometimes later, they reach the pond. Kenichi shines the light below, and spots some flower buds, but they needed its seed not the flower. He then browses Shangri-La, and pulls out a large dingy. Both were surprised to see him pull out a boat from his item box. Nianyas tells Crouton that he's glad that Mr. came along with them, while Kenichi paddles toward the middle of the pond. He looks around, and finds the white flower with a seed in the middle. Kenichi shows them the seed, and Crouton was glad that he can now save his daughter. But suddenly Nyanya spots something. Inside a bush he could see a monstrous silhouette, but actually it was just Vel. All of them were relieved that it wasn't a monster. Kenichi then realized Vel might have followed him all the way here. But then something alerts Vel, and she looks back at the forest clearing, and hisses towards it. It seems something else might be coming, and they were in a large group. Kenichi then spots the wolves approaching them. To be more precise, they were black wolves. He then summons two swords, and hands the flower seed to Crouton, further telling him Top quickly take the seed to Mary, because he's going to stall them here. They both tries to stop him stating that's reckless. But Kenichi knows he and Vel can handle this alone. So just go, or it will be all for naught if Crouton doesn't make it in time. Crouton panics and thinks about what to do. Should he go to save his daughter, or help Kenichi? Then suddenly Kenichi yells at him to go and save his daughter's life. This made him realize what to do, and they run to save Mary's life. With the speed of the beast folk the black wolves won't be able to outrun them, so Kenichi doesn't have to worry. So now it was time to kick some Mars. Kenichi then summons a power shovel, and he started swinging it wildly wrecking a lot of mayhem, and Vel too claims quite a few soul. Realizing their loss the black wolves retreat. Kenichi comes out and stores away the power shovel. He has already beaten so many black wolves that he isn't afraid of them anymore. But then suddenly Vel gets her spider sense tingled, and she quickly pulls Kenichi's away. He didn't understand what just happened, but when he looks back he sees an arrow nudged in a tree. Kenichi was shocked since he was sitting there just now. The black wolves couldn't possibly use arrows, which means there's a new enemy. Kenichi then shines the light at the tree nearby and spots three silhouette. He can't see clearly because the light reflects off their golden hair and long ears, which means they are clearly elves. They were telling him something but Kenichi couldn't understand their language. He was too stunned to see the long-eared elf that one sees in fantasy movies right in front of him. And this made him realize maybe the black wolves ran away because of the elves? Seeing the elves draw their weapon he quickly tells them to wait for a minute. He also tells Vel to lower her guard. Seeing a human speak with a forest cat, the elves began to discuss something among themselves. Later an elf turned to him, and throws something at him. It was a ring, and Kenichi was told to put it on. After wearing the ring, the elf told him to listen to his words. He tells him about the ring being a translating device. He asks Kenichi if he has come to raid the springs. Kenichi explains how he have come here to pick some seeds for his friend's daughter treatment. But the elves didn't believe in him, and sensing that Val came between them, Elves were shocked to see a forest cat protecting a human. Kenichi then explains why he was here and how they were surrounded by black wolves, so he had to fight them to get that medicine. The other elf then looks around, and asks if he was the one who killed all those black wolves laying around, and what is that light thing in his hand. Kenichi then tells them he is a merchant, and if there's something they would like he have spices, salt and everything in his item box. Seeing their interest in salt, Kenichi shows them a lot of other things like knives and books for kids. The elf then took the book and read a few pages. He asks if people still think this is a beautiful story, because the lifespans of elves and humans are different, and they are unable to have children together. So when the elf could no longer live in the human village, the elf eventually fled back to the forest. Kenichi was surprised to hear it actually happened. The elf realizing Kenichi is a merchant, and since the forest cat is also fond of him, he can't be a bad human. And since salt is in short supply in their village, they are willing to let him off if he's willing to make a deal with them. But firstly Kenichi was mostly concerned about Mary's condition, but since Crouton took those special berries he thinks they will be able to handle it. Kenichi also thinks about taking on the elves with his power shovel, but they seem to use magic, and he don't want to get into trouble later on. So he decided to make a deal with them. The elf then tells him to follow, 
and later they reached the elven village inside the forest. Kenichi was told to sit, and in front of him was the village chief. He was told that Kenichi has decided to make a deal with them, and Kenichi was happy to give them the salt free of charge as a token of goodwill. But that won't do, since a deal needs a price but they don't have much money ready. Well it's not strange since they live in the middle of the forest. So Kenichi decided to trade salt for the translating ring. And well if he is okay with the ring, then so be it. Now with this much salt they can distribute it to all the houses. So the chief thanks him for the help. Kenichi then tries to sell them the other products he have. But due to elven custom all the necessities of their lifestyle are made by themselves. So the chief had to say no. Well if it's their custom he can't blame them. Later since the night is dangerous they decided to let Kenichi stay the night in the village. And he wonders if he's now free of the charge of being a person who came to destroy springs and forests? The chief told him he knows one when he see them. This made Kenichi wonder if he used magic or was it just a guess. Well anyway it was nice of them to let him stay tonight, but he was hungry. He then asks an elf for permission to cook a meal in the village square. Well he didn't mind since their food is probably not well suited for humans. Later at the village square all the elves seems to be enjoying themselves. Kenichi walks through them and they don't seem to have any hostile intentions. It seems they might have heard what's going on. Kenichi then sat in a corner and thinks about what to eat. He pulls out a cup noodle and was preparing to steam his rice ball in a steamer. When an elf girl came over asking what was he doing, he tells her was cooking and he's not going to interfere with the elves. But by then she was already going through his pot. She asks what it was, and Kenichi tells her it was grain food warmed by steams. He then hands her a rice ball to eat and after a single bite she was already mesmerized by its taste. Kenichi was happy to see her appreciate his rice balls. Then she asks him what was he eating, while well, he was having his noodles, and it seems she wanted to try that too. So he gave her some of his noodles, and it seems she was enjoying it like a gal, but then again she might be a 500-year-old woman. Suddenly all the elves gather around asking him to let them taste some. Well it's fine but he demands a price like wild plants and mushrooms, hearing that the elves went off to gather some. Later while the elves were having their meal he asks if they are getting enough nutrition, cause the food they eat usually are far from a complete and balanced meal, but they were fine with that. After all, they have Che Che too. She then brings a cup with liquid inside, its color was red and it smells like chocolate, and when he tasted it, it was bitter. Kenichi then asks if this was a sacred drink that should not be tasted differently? Well it was not, so he added sugar in it, and asks her to try it again. With just one sip of that drink, she was amazed by how good it tasted. Everyone else then began to ask a sugar drink of their own, and Kenichi too was pleased to taste that nostalgic taste of his original world. Suddenly the village chief barges in asking what's with the ruckus? The elf girl then tells him to try this drink? He was hesitant, but after his first sip, he too was shocked. He began asking Kenichi what the heck did he add? Well it was just a bit of sugar and if he likes it he can get him some in exchange for the ingredients for this drink. The crowd were exhilarated to hear that. Now they want to drink Che Che with sugar every day. The village chief thought this taste could corrupt the elves and he cannot admit that. But after the constant booing from the residents, he had to make that deal with Kenichi. And after the transaction was done, the chocolate party that followed made him a fully accepted friend of the elves. Later he also took some photos of the hidden elves and as he took pictures, he happened to run into a forest cat's kitten. And just like that the night quickly passed. Next morning the village chief thanks him for sharing the salt and tells him to stop by again. Kenichi tells him he lives by the shores of the spring, and if there's anything they need, they can just pay him a visit anytime. Hearing that the elf girls wonder if they could pay him with their bodies instead of money. But Kenichi wasn't into that, unless they force him a little. Well this situation was unavoidable but still he's concerned about Marie's condition, so he quickly pulls out his motorcycle and leaves. Sometimes later, Kenichi burst open the door asking how's Mary doing? Everyone present in the room were quite taken aback. He spots Mary sleeping on her bed, and it seems she is better now. Suddenly Nianyas grabs him and started apologizing for leaving his comrade behind. But well Mary's life was top priority after all, and he can use magic plus he had Vel with him. Nianyas then started to thank Forest Katsama, and it seems Val was quite smug about it. Kenichi then asks Granny how was Mary doing? Well she's okay now after all he picked the seeds she needed. Then suddenly Kruton and his wife started to thank Kenichi for saving their daughter, and Kenichi couldn't say much. After all he's not the kind of person to help people at all, but one can help it when a child's life is on the line. Later Mayuri was angry at Kenichi for not bringing her to have such fun adventure. 
and she took all that anger out on him. But it wasn't like he was there on vacation, and they couldn't leave Anemone alone. Mayuri I got depressed realizing he was right. Anemone then thanks Kenichi for saving Mary, and he was pleased to see her happy. He then shows the presents he brought for both of them, and it was Che Che. Mayuri I was amazed by it, and Anemone couldn't believe its sweet taste which is bitter at the same time. But isn't chocolate bad for cats? Well beast folks are half human so we will leave it at that. A short time later, Mary made a full recovery and Crouton along with the rest of the villagers moved to the safety of Nora's pole barony. Kenichi tells Crouton to be careful on their journey, and tells Anemone to give this book to Mary. She approaches her, and shows her the new book which she and Kenichi made for her as a present. Anemone then hands her the book telling her to take care, and Mary started crying. She hugs her and bids farewell. Kenichi then approaches Crouton, and hands him a letter of introduction as promised with five gold pieces as a parting gift. He thanks Kenichi again stating he will never forget this favor. Crouton then looks at his wife, and hands Kenichi two rings cause they don't have any money left. Looking at it Kenichi wonders if those are their wedding rings? Well yes they bought them a long time ago at an old tool shop, although this might not worth a gold coin. But he tells him to keep it as collateral for the money he owes him. Crouton then thanks him again and starts to leave, and just like that Crouton's family left to start a journey of their own. Sensing Anemone's sad mood, Kenichi pulls out his camera, and shows her the pictures of the elves, he also tells her about ring that he got which allows him to have a conversations with elves. Then she comes to a picture of a little kitty which looked like a cute ball, and seeing a forest cat's kitten for the first time Mayuri starts to sniff the camera, and Kenichi had to tell her it doesn't work that way. Somewhere in the forest, we see a well-endowed woman walking, while humming a creepy tune, as she thinks of Kenichi. A dull middle-aged man with a small open-air stall, that's what she have thought of Kosuka at first. However when she talked to him, she found him surprisingly soft-spoken and intelligent, giving the impression of an aristocrat or official. The products he handled were also accessories for sale polished with a high level of technology that she had never seen before. Primula thought this man could be useful cause he even has an item box. So later she introduced Kosuka to her father, and the Mallow Trading Company became popular with the nobles because of the rare good they provide. They even received the family name for their contribution to the country, thanks to the new vehicle invented by Kenichi. Mallow then joyously states how his company has benefited tremendously from Kenichi's help, so they must repay this kindness. Well he doesn't have to worry cause his daughter was already planning ahead. But later she realized how surprisingly firm Kenichi is. He always had beast folk woman around him. And even though she had bathed and slept next to him, Kenichi never made a move on her. Nonetheless Kenichi came to rescue her from the bandits. And that's when she decided to follow this man for life. Primula then saw him taking care of the other women and children who were rescued. But she was supposed to be the first among them. Well after the report and processing of this matter she decided to see Kenichi again all dressed up cause she knows he will wait. But it didn't go as she planned, everything was gone, the little house, the fields and even the fences. Kenichi actually went away with that girl and didn't say a single word to her and just imagining that was enough to break her as she creepily laugh in the forest. Currently Primula was in Aslanti in search of her beloved with the dark aura surrounding her. Suddenly Kenichi felt a jolt, and he looks around all tensed up, the granny then wonders why he has been acting up for a while, and what's brought him here today, while well, Kenichi came for the grimoire and to dismantle the prey he hunted. He then tells her about the so-called tusk bear that he hunted and tried to dismantle but it was too big, so he decided to do it in the adventurer's guild because he can also get a good price for its tusks and skin. The granny then hands him the grimoire, the cover was thick and fancy, but what's the purpose of the stone embedded in the back? Well that's a magic stone, the granny explains how the spells written in the book are tied to the stone, so without that the magic formula can't be activated. Which means even if Kenichi copies the book the grimoire would be deemed useless. Well yes but magic stones are the things that monsters have and sometimes adventurers sell them to the guild, so he could buy them from the stores. Kenichi then remembers the magic tool he bought from granny has been useful to extract biodiesel fuel, so he's sure this grimoire will be helpful with that too. Later at the Adventurer's Guild, Kenichi was able to sell some herbs that he had accumulated, and he also got a chance to feast his eyes before dismantling the tusk bears. The butcher then comes by asking if he came to dismantle some prey and sell things? Well yeah, but he can't put it out here because it's a little too big, so they decided to do it in the back. Seeing such a large tusk bear the butcher was shocked, and Kenichi then pulls out twelve black wolves as well. 
He tells him to take apart the magic stones and the edible parts, and he would like to sell the other parts here. After that the butcher began dismantling them but he had to do it quickly because he can't risk them rotting. Kenichi was told it would be ready by evening but the sun was still high, so he decided to go back to his house and show up later. After a while Kenichi got four gold coins and two silver coins, and he also got the magic stones and the meat. The butcher then asks him to bring more like these again, as Kenichi leaves the store. He already told Anemone and Myerii that he might have to stay in the city tonight, but it seems he might make it in time. Then suddenly a hand appears behind him, and it grabs Kenichi. He looks back to find a crazy woman holding him down, and he recognizes her as Primula-san. Kenichi wonders why was she here, but before he could say anything Primula hugs him, stating he's the worst to disappear like that. Well the nobles were after Kenichi so he didn't want Mallow Trading Company to get caught up in his problems. But it isn't Kenichi's decision to decide what's a problem for her. Well Primula was right but there are a lot of resentment from other business, so he had to leave quietly. But Primula wasn't done with it, which caused quite a stir among the crowd. Kenichi then looks around for a place where they can discuss this calmly, and then he spots a restaurant for it. Later at the restaurant which also serves as an inn. Primula was still going on about how the Mal Trading Company had been in Kenichi's care. But he didn't know that he took care of them that much. Well it seems the goods that he delivered were very popular among the nobles. And that helped in making the company very favorable. Kenichi then asks her about the proposal from Nora's pole baron. Well she did receive an offer from him but she declined. It seems the baron's honor is completely destroyed so Kenichi hopes he's okay. Primula then tells him about how the people in the town were mad at her for turning down the baron. So Kenichi tell her to go back to Dahlia and apologize. But Primula wouldn't go cause she already bid farewell to her father and she won't return until Kenichi comes back with her. Hearing that Kenichi felt bad for Malosan but he won't be going back to Dahlia. Well then neither will she. Kenichi then asks how she know he was in Dahlia? Well that's cause she went around every merchant and adventurer guild asking for their record. And a few days ago she found Kenichi's name in the records of an adventurer's guild. And then she searched for Kenichi in the city. Kenichi then realized the gates will close soon, so he decides to take Primula to his house. But she won't be going, she won't go anywhere until Kenichi makes her a woman here tonight. Hearing that he was quite shocked, so he decided to tell her to back down, but seeing how bravely embarrassed she was while admitting that. Kenichi calls up the waitress, and asks if they had any room left, cause they are gonna stay here tonight. Later upstairs, they were inside a nice room. Kenichi notices Primula who was undressing herself. He then asks why she was so hasty. Well she can't give him any chance to run away again. Primula then asks if she can take a bath. Well Primula-san is perfect as she is right now. But Primula states she haven't had a bath in a while. Well it's fine. Although her hair was a bit rough. They can properly wash it once they're at home. And before he does the deed he wonders if this is really okay. Next day they ride back on the bike. And hearing the engine sound Anemone wonders if Kenichi was back. Well yeah he is, but who did he bring along? It was Malo's daughter Primula. Well due to what happened last night Kenichi brought Primula with him. He then finally realizes what he has done, but it doesn't matter now cause he already resolved himself to this last night. With Primula in the mix he's now responsible for the lives of two women, a kid and a forest cat. But despite how beautiful and elegant Primula looks, she has the guts and energy of her father which is kind of scary to him. They also decided to not have children until they settled down and talked about it. Then suddenly Primula shouts that he had left her behind and yet he brought Myerii along with him. Kenichi tells her to calm down cause Myerii came after him by tracking his scent. So what about Anemone then? Well she's a kid so there's no way he could have left her behind. Hearing that she decided to let Kenichi off the hook for today. Anemone then asks if Primula was going to live here too cause the room's gonna be cramped. Kenichi then realizes that there could be some tension between these girls. He could almost visualize sparks between them, so he decided to calm them down. Anemone then asks if Kenichi's planning to bring anyone else? Well he is not, but seeing how long he took to answer, Primula asks if he have some other women somewhere? And while Kenichi was trying to explain, Vel comes by wondering who's the new family member, and seeing Primula she just looked away. Realizing that even the forest cat was looking down on her, Primula was miserable. Kenichi then explains that Vel too is another one who just came by herself. Well that was lie since he had carried Vel with him in the back of the bike. But he couldn't risk displeasing Primula any more than this. Later that evening, he started grilling the meat he got from the tusk bear after the guild had dismantled it. Firstly he cuts the meat finely and seals it on the grill. 
The smell of the meat cooking was appetizing, so he added a sauce he found at Shangri-La, and after the dish was ready they all had a taste, and the meat was horribly hard to chew. The toughness is something but the smell was abysmal. Even Mayuri I didn't like the taste of the bear meat, and it seems the girls were also not enjoying it either. So he decided to do something about it real quick. He buys a meat tenderizer to pound it, and for smell he makes a secret sauce. First he adds some soy sauce then some chili pepper and tangerine peel, and that's it. Once it was done the spices made the meat edible. But Primula doesn't seem to like it, so Kenichi offers her a different cut. Well there's a pile of bear meat after all, and they also need to eat the black wolf's meat. If it's just grilled meat he can manage to eat it, but maybe this is not so good if it's stewed? So he decided to research it a bit. Now that the number of residents has increased there are a lot more inconveniences. For starters both the girls wanted to have a bath with Kenichi, but he already told them to take turns because the bath isn't that big. And although there are plastic bathtubs in Shangri-La they are no different from the drum bath, so in the end he bought another one. But Anemone wanted to get in bath with Kenichi, which made him wonder what was the point to buy the bath then. Anemone was very insistent so he lets her in, and he tells Anemone he needs to take a bath by himself sometime, but she quickly says no. Kosuka then looks at side and spots Primula, so he tells her to stop hiding and get in the bath, but she seems too embarrassed to come out. So Kenichi tells her that she can take a bath by herself later, hearing that she quickly jumps in with Mayuri. And lastly the bath ends with bubbles poured over Mayuri fur. It was common to see the ladies drying their hair with the jet heater after the bath, but from today one more blonde woman has joined them. The next day Kenichi spent the morning trying to find a way to eat the large amount of bear meat in his item box. He marinated the pounded meat in milk overnight and fried it in oil and made a curry out of it. After that he decided to put it in the item box and reserve it. He also pounded some more meat and rubbed it with herbs and spices. Then he marinated the meat for grilling and brandy and left some meat for stew and wine. After letting it marinate while working on the field, he made the meat marinated in brandy into steaks and those marinated in wine into stew. He tastes it and it had a normal edible taste. Then he decided to make a big batch of pickles and store it in his item box. Later for dinner he made curry and it was appreciated by the girls. They seems to be enjoying the curry because they were gulping it down. Primula then wonders if it's the same stinky meat from before? Well it's a bit gamey but it's pretty good. Primula then praises Kenichi cause he can make any meat into a wonderful dish. Well it did took a lot of time and effort to make it taste good. But in this case milk, liquor and herbs helped a lot. And eating wild game is part of what living a slow life is. Mayuria then further adds that vegetables don't taste bitter anymore if Kenichi cooks it. Well it's cause if he soaks vegetables in water it neutralizes the bitterness. But Primula feels as if Kenichi is a sage as he can do anything. Kenichi was embarrassed by hearing that. But this reminds it of the grimoire. He almost forgot about it so he pulls it out and reads it. The grimoire contains lot of info but in short it mostly tells about the way to circulate magic through the body and manifest it in a single place. Kenichi tries putting it in practice and he recites a spell, he loudly chants for fireball. But nothing happens, he then gets depressed and began to wonder if it's because he got no talent for magic. While Anemone checks the grimoire, he asks Primula if he can sell grimoire quickly? Well some people does collect them even if they can't use magic. He then began to wonder if he could sell this quickly because keeping it feels like a waste. Suddenly he notices Anemone chanting the spell, and before he could stop her, a fireball comes out of her palm and starts burning the wall. Kenichi quickly tries to find a fire extinguisher and searches Shangri-La. He buys out three extinguisher and tells the girl to follow his lead, and then they slowly extinguish the fire. It seems the surface of the wall got burnt but the inside was safe, although it wasn't much of firepower but against a human body it would be lethal. But now is not the time to be amazed, because Anemone was shivering while apologizing profusely. Kenichi then praises her stating she could actually use magic, and this seems to calm her a bit. Mayuri too was excited cause with magic tusk bears won't be a problem now, but Anemone can't possibly use fireball on them cause they will get scorched and no one will buy the materials. Well yeah he was right. Suddenly Anemone falls down and passes out. Mayuri tells him that this happens to kids who use magic for the first time so they decided to take her to bed. They then took turns nursing Anemone and fortunately her fever was gone by morning. Anemone was a bit listless but she seems to be doing okay. However she still had no appetite. This reminds Kenichi of a classic snack for sick kids, so he pulls out a canned peaches. It was a sweetened fruit pickle and they are perfect for time like this. She takes a bite and enjoyed it a lot because of its sweetness. 
and now since the lid is off he decided to eat all together. It seems the fruit was similar to this world's rinkas and the girls liked it a lot. Kenichi further tells them about how it can preserve in salt but sweetening them is just as effective. But the sugar was something that only nobles can afford because it's monopolized in this country. And hearing this primula had a great idea. Later Kenichi was fixing the wall, and he was truly amazed for Anemone to be able to use magic. Primula wonders if she already had talent for it. Kenichi then asks if there are any school or something to learn magic. Well there's a university in the royal capital and if one graduates from there she can become a holy mage. But there's a lot of royals and children of successful merchants there so admission from the general public is a constant struggle. Anemone quickly tells them that she doesn't want to be separated from Kenichi, while well, he wasn't going to force her anyway. However fire magic alone might be enough to draw her away for combat. It is said that one can increase the types of magic one possesses by paying other mages to teach them, or by purchasing grimoires. Kenichi then wonders if this magic can be used to boil a bath. Primula laughs at this cause it's her first time hearing that someone wants to use fireball to boil a bath. But Anemone was hyped to try it, once she recovers. Well Kenichi too was looking forward to this. Cause if she succeeds the time required to boil a bath will be greatly reduced. Kenichi the finished fixing the walls and he renovated the shed that he built before. Later while they were collecting medicinal herbs. Primula tells Kenichi that she would like to open a business in Atlantia. And since she's obviously registered to the merchant guild she could easily do it. But Kenichi doesn't have much to sell. Most of the stuff he had has been sold in Dahlia. Like these picture books. Seeing a book. She quickly read through it, and it was splendidly drawn, but Kenichi didn't explain to her how he made it, because the printing technology would be a pretty revolutionary thing in this world. But that wasn't all, she can also sell the vegetables when they are ready or catch a fish and make dried fish. And in the end Primula's idea was to sell bear meat stew and sweetened rinka which was inspired by the canned peaches. And seeing the excitement on Primula's face, he wishes her business goes well. Next day Kenichi immediately started to teach Primula how to cook. First was the stew made from bear meat, and the other dish was rinka. It tasted really different from the stuff they sell in town. Primula then decided to try making it herself, so Kenichi lends her the magic stove. Well, she said she will earn money soon and buy it herself, so she will just borrow it for now. Kenichi then puts all her stuff in his item box and sent her to the front of town on his bike. Later, when the sun was setting, he came to pick her. There he notices Primula with someone in an alley. Kenichi then approaches her and asks, How was it? Well it was sold out cause Kenichi's cooking is the best of the best, and there's no way the customers would pass the chance to eat a high class meal from an open air restaurant. Kenichi then asks who was the beast folk that's with her? The beast folk then introduces herself as Nyamena. Well many men would underestimate a woman seller on her own so Primula hired her as her guard, and Nyamena just had to glare at men, and she gets paid one silver coin a day so it's the best job ever for her. Later while Kenichi was putting all the stuff in his item box, Primula asks if they could invite Nyamina for dinner. Well of course she protected her after all. Later outside Kenichi's house, Mayuriai was surprised to see a bike that was fast enough to travel through the forest, and she couldn't believe it works without having to pedal. Primula then enthusiastically tells him about the book she sold for two silver each, and since she had 18 books so it must be less than one gold coin. Primula then tells Kenichi about the request she got for books with illustrations about girls. Well all the men only thinks about that kind of stuff after all. Hearing this Kenichi realizes if they ever find trouble with money then he can make them. So it was good to know there's demand. Mayuriai then comes out to greet them. She excitedly greets Kenichi. But seeing a beast folk along him, she angrily asks who was the woman? Well she's Primula's guard and she's here to have dinner with them. Hearing the noises Vel comes out and Kenichi pats her head. Seeing this Nyamina understands why Kenichi lives deep in the forest. After all was done and everyone was here they decided to have a meal. Today's menu was cream stew and bread. And Nyamina was dumbfounded by the color of the stew. While well, it was made with flour and boiled milk hence the white color. She then chomps on it and it tasted really good. While Nyamina praises the stew's rich taste, Kenichi offers her a glass of liquor. And when she chugs on it, the taste was really delicious. The food and the liquor was great so it was like she was in paradise. Kenichi then asks if she would like to take a bath. Later he was prepping the bath, and after he was done, Kenichi asks Anemone to do her thing. She then starts to chant, and a fireball comes out from her palm, which ignites the wood heating the bath. The immediate firepower looked great, but the flame was already dying down. The water was warming up steadily and a bath that normally takes an hour to boil now only takes about 30 minutes thanks to anemone. 
Kenichi then wonders if it was safe to use magic all the time. After all Anemone fainted not too long ago, Primula explains that magic grows more if one uses it more often. Hearing that he wonders if it was like getting more XP. But XP doesn't exist in this world though. Later Nayamina was enjoying a hot bath and feeling as if she was a noble. It was her best experience cause in the city the beast folks weren't allowed to go inside the bath. Later she rests in the bed, which was very fluffy, and now she just wanted to live there. But Mayuri I didn't want another resident cause they'll have no space at all. While they were arguing on the bed, Anemone was busy writing. Nayamina looks aside and notices Kenichi teaching Anemone. She lies down asking if he was the one teaching her? Well it was better to be able to read, write, and calculate to get a wider range of jobs. Cause he have heard that there aren't many jobs for women. Well that was right because in the end uneducated women have no choice but to become working girl. Kenichi then asks Anemone if she would like to go with Primula and learn how to do business. But Anemone wanted to learn more magic and help Kenichi so she can go out on adventures with him. Well if Kenichi could, he wouldn't want to do much fighting himself. But Anemone known that if it's Kenichi he can even take down a dragon. Well he knows that one life wouldn't be enough to pull that off. But he have heard there's someone in the empire who took down a dragon. Nayamina perks up cause she have heard it too. Apparently a mage killed a dragon using his magic. Hearing that Kenichi wonders if magic is effective on dragons. And are they even worth any money? Well of course their whole body is worth a ton of money. And especially their meat is very tasty? Kenichi then wonders if the mage got rich after killing the dragon? Well he normally would have but apparently he was the imperial crown princess mage. And the young lady took it all. Well that's how the royals and nobles are. And apparently the crown princess used the money to finance a war against the emperor who was trying to have the second princess succeed him. That sounds interesting. So are they the Einsters and Nubountain family? It seems Kenichi knew his stuff, and seeing Nayamina so close with Kenichi, Mayuri freaks out. She quickly dashes towards them, and hugs Kenichi tightly. Nayamina asks if she was jealous? Well it was quite obvious, but Mayuri doesn't say anything to Anemone or Primula, and apparently another beast folk was too much for her heart. Kenichi then leaves them alone cause it was too noisy. He then asks Primula how she met Nayamina? Well she was a customer first, and when she came across the food it was tasty and good so she ended up eating a lot. And since Primula was a woman she would have preferred a female guard and since a female beast folk are strong she can rely on her. But still Nayamina was amazed to see a woman doing business on her own. Well her father is a great merchant after all, so it was in her blood. Nayamina then wonders why Kenichi isn't in business too. Well he has made some money so he's taking it easy now. Nayamina realizes he was a strange merchant because usually merchants are all about money, but that's not in his case right? Primula agrees as she giggles. Well that's cause Kenichi just wants to take it easy and enjoy his slow life. Next day looking at the huge cliff he was quite taken aback. Up close it looks like a huge wall which gotta be at least 10 meters high. Looking at it he wonders how's he going to climb it? Earlier that morning, Kenichi was thinking about what to do cause Primula was safely settled into her business. Maybe it was time to expand their range of activities. There were monsters deep in the forest, and crossing the lake was kind of scary. Well come to think of it there was a cliff behind the house, and there was forest on top of that cliff as well. And if the area has never been explored before there must be a large amount of plants that haven't been collected. Well that was it, he then decides to climb that cliff. But there's no way he can do that. So Kenichi pulls out his drone and decided to do some recon for now. He flies it above the cliff and spots the highlands which don't seem to be connected to mountains. And since there's no road leading to Atlantia or any sign of development, Kenichi theorizes that land must be untouched so there will be plenty of medicinal herbs and wild plants. Suddenly Anemone approaches him, excitedly stating how far she could see with the binoculars he had given her earlier. She then asks what was Kenichi looking for? Because she just spotted many sparkly orange stones. Kenichi then asks if he could see too, and when he looks through the binocular, he spots an orange gemstone. It was a kind that he hasn't seen before, so he hopes it fetches a good price. But well they were really high, and to reach there he would need a high lift truck. So first he bought a laser range finder and measured the distance which was 12 meters. So using an elevating vehicle would be uneconomical because for every use it will need fuel after all. Kenichi then get a brilliant idea to build a scaffold, so he summons power shovel and levels the ground. He then buys elevated scaffolds, which arrives in pieces. Mayuri then comes along wondering what he was doing. 
Well, he was building a scaffolds to climb up the cliff, cause there's a forest above which might be unexplored so it would be filled with medicinal herbs and more prey. Both Myerii and Anemone excitedly asked if they could help, and later they began constructing the scaffold together. With the help of only two people it was completed in three days. While Kenichi was admiring his big accomplishment, Myerii impatiently began climbing to the top. Seeing this Anemone too wanted to go up, and later they both were enjoying the view. Kenichi then realizes the sun was already setting, so he was running late to pick up Primula. Later both the girls were surprised to see what Kenichi was building. Nayamina climbs up wondering what it was built for. Well it's used to climb to the top of the cliff, Primula then asks Kenichi. If he pulled these iron tubes and all kinds of stuff from his item box? And what about the soft bread they eat every day? Kenichi then lies about about how he was magically creating the breads. He then pulls her from her hips and kisses passionately. This sparks something deep within Primula, and Kenichi slowly slides his hands below her hips, sending a jolt inside her. Nayamina calls them out to refrain doing those things in front of the others, cause it was kinda hard to watch. Hearing this Primula gets shy, and they all heads back home. Um guys, next video will be about some other series, but don't you worry I will continue to make video about this series until the final chapter, and if you have any suggestion about some other manga or manawa series that you want me to recap, then comment it down in the video. Thank you for watching, leave a like and subscribe for more such videos, until next time, bye.